Desi Puyi Lestari. She is the head of research and development of the Artificial Intelligence Center in Bandung Institute of Technology in Indonesia. Uh, each speaker will have uh, 10 minutes for their participation and uh, we will have 35 uh, discussion session uh, where you can uh, have uh, your questions. So uh, we will start. Yeah, we will start with Judith Clavens. Uh, she is a linguist and computer scientist and has been active in academia, industry and government in furthering the development and application of computational approaches to the study of language. Uh, she's a senior research scientist at the University of Maryland, USA. Thank you. I'm happy to be here for several reasons. First of all, thank you to the translators up there in the booths. We are uh, acknowledge the work that they're doing for us. I will try to speak slowly for you. The organizers of the meeting have asked me to give a brief overview of achievements in NLP. And I had a little bit of trouble with the achievements uh, uh, issue without talking about some of the challenges, so I, I will be covering both. So, there's a clicker. When we think about natural language processing, we have a wordle that pretty much tells us should speak to most people in the room. You've got language, you've got understanding, you've got rules which became a little smaller over the years. You've got uh, machine learning which has become a little larger over the years. Um, Rule-based and machine learning you can see are there. And my, many of the topics that other people have covered are uh, in this session. So, if we think about where we've been and where we're going in natural language processing, most of you know that history of natural language of processing is generally said to have begin, begun in the 50s, maybe 1940s. When Turing published his article on, uh, in, in psychology and philosophy, we don't have a pointer here, so I'm going to have to just point and you'll have to follow. Um, on explicating the Turing test, so can your machine convince a human that you're also a human? Everything we've been hearing about so far today, and I wasn't here yesterday, talks about translation, talks about other kinds of interactions. Do you really know that it's human-like? So that's our goal. And of course, um, I'm not going to talk about machine translation, other people are, so I will not talk about Warren Weaver's noisy channel approach, which also in 1949. What some people don't know is that neural nets, oh, thank you, for pointer, ah, thank you. What many people, how do we get it to point? Hold on, we gotta, I have to be, I have to be. There must be a button. The first one. The first one. There we go, points, right, little teeny point. Um, what most people don't know is that uh, neural nets also came into being in 1943. So machine learning is not new, neural nets are not new. What's new, of course, is what's happened with them computationally over the years. Uh, neural nets came in, as I have here, in 1943. Um, but, of course, if you think about early approaches to NLP, which is something that was mentioned, before in the morning talks, most of the techniques used, used um, Bayesian inferencing for probability computations. So through these conditional dependence relationships in a directed graph, you could conduct inference on random variables in the graph. And the short version is, if I've seen this before, I can guess something again. What we're dealing with now is um, something completely different. Because what we're dealing with now is machine learning that allows you to look at something you haven't seen before. And that's the major achievement that I'm going to talk about today very briefly. So, um, machine learning and rules 
are all basically model building. If there's anything that I'd like you to take away from what I'm going to say in my few minutes today is that rules are not dead. Rules are not dead. Thank you. <laughs> Certainly in many of the computational approaches that are effective, rules don't really play a role. But they're very valuable and very important for the work that we do, and I'm going to wrap up with that at the very end. So when I talk about the major achievement, I'm going to be talking about transfer learning. The rules that are involved are not the ones that we as linguists or educators, which I hope there's some educators, language professionals, data collectors, anthropological linguists, and so on in the room. Um, what I want to do is marry these two fields to make sure that we understand that what we're doing matters for all of us because we have a goal in mind, documentation and keeping our languages alive. So what I'm going to talk about is the latest achievements on transfer learning. Transfer-based learning is very simple. If you read it officially, um, which I will read through this definition, given a source, uh, a source domain, let's see if I can get the right thing going here, my mother, there we go. Given a source domain and a learning task, a target domain and a learning task, transfer learning aims to improve the learning of the target predictive function in using the knowledge in the domain where the, do the first domain that you train on is not the second one that you guess on which is why this whole approach really matters for under-resourced languages and low-resourced languages. So the concept of transfer learning is something very easy. If you play the piano, you probably can play the piano. If you play the violin, you can play the piano more easily. There's negative transfer. This has been around in psychology since the 60s. If you learn to drive a car on the right side of the road, you won't be so good at driving on the left side. But if you learned on the left side from the get-go, you'd be fine. That's negative transfer. We don't like that. We like positive transfer, which is what is going on and what you've heard about a little bit about earlier today with the uh, Sesame Street characters, Bert, Roberta, and so on. So to take one example, sentiment classification. Um, first, you need to collect many reviews of a product and then annotate them. And then you can get a different product and transfer to see how well you do on that. This, this data, these data guessing uh, techniques have been working extraordinarily well. However, you have to label the data, and it's very expensive. And you have to run the data with huge uh, compute power, which is very expensive. And so even though many of the models are being made available, and we heard in earlier talks much of the code is made, being made available, if you don't have the goods to run it, you're out of luck. So this is something that we need to face as a community together to make sure some of these things can be handled in ways that help us um, really deal with language at the ground level. Transfer learning is so valuable because it can reduce the effort for annotating uh, for annotating overall. So in the case of sentiment detection, you don't really have to annotate all the reviews of that particular area because you can adapt your classification model that's trained on some products to help you learn for others. So the transfer learning can save you a lot of effort. Let me just go here. Good. Okay. Two more? Okay. So I gave the example of sentiment detection. BERT, which is the bidirectional encoder, has been talked about earlier today. There are available versions already available on pre-trained massive data sets. So as I said, anyone can do it. Ha ha. Um, and these transfer models are extremely important for what we're trying to do with the low resource languages. So what's the role of the linguist am amidst all of this? The role of the linguist is essential. And uh, 
for a couple of reasons. First of all, in language resource preparation, uh, some of us earlier at the break were discussing the early ELRA efforts and LREC meetings on building language resources. And features that are linguistically relevant must be annotated accurately linguistically. So if you're doing sentiment detection, most psychologists, most people know if something's positive or negative. You don't need any specific training. But if you're doing part of speech labeling, lexical categorization, syntactic building, got it, you do need the expertise. Also evaluation. Many of our evaluation metrics really don't, don't give us any information on what the usability. And finally, we have one other issue, which is my final slide, if I can find it. Um, is we have common sense knowledge. That's our biggest challenge. This is my final slide. Thank you very much to UNESCO and to lt for all organizers for putting this meeting together. And most of the, many of the efforts in the states have been funded through U.S. government fundings, through uh, the Material Project and the Lorelei Project, which you will hear about later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Jean Senela. He is Chief, Tech, Chief Executive Officer of Zystron, a pioneer in machine translation. Um, we have a research session here, so you might argue he is not a researcher, but he still is in his heart. I think he has been also Director of Research and Development of uh, Zystron, and uh, he is giving a presentation about neuro machine translation. Thank you, Volker. And promise I won't talk about product. So I've been working for Cisran for 20 years and something I learned is that machine translation doesn't exist. It's not a solution. Machine translation is a collection of tools. And this has been, been developed for years. We kind of forget that it has been start, started more than 50 years ago. And, um, and the usage of the machine translation are the tools that we are developing. And the machine translation itself is just a collection of tools. You cannot just say, I want a tool. You say, I want a hammer, I want a screwdriver. It's the same for translation. There is no one solution, there is multiple tools. And some of the tools were already effective 50 years ago, and it is why it was invented. 50 years ago, machine translation were used to discover something in language. So there, was, there was, were a lot of... Uh, of text talking about some, some I don't know, some uh, aerospace in Russia and US wanted to know what was this document talking about. And machine translation was a tool to discover meaning part of that. Uh, later, the, the machine translation was used to improve productivity of translator, the translate uh, use case. Then there was the understanding. When you go on the web, um, when Babelfish was launched in 97, the, the, the web was also growing and people wanted to know what was happening outside in the, in the in US when you are in France, in China, uh, and we had the need to understand. So machine translation was a tool to understand and to translate automatically. And then came the, the publish use case where machine translation was good enough to just publish uh, some text without any post editing on, online. And now we are talking about communicating. For all these years, there has been a lot of change in the technology. So uh, there has been three major changes from rule-based, uh, what, uh, statistical mesh translation, and normal mesh translation. We are talking about AI today, and this is normal mesh trans translation. This is really the new kid in the block with very amazing abilities. And we can see that most of the use cases that we have identified so far are kind of well covered. Some, are, uh, some new will be coming, but the, the current use cases are well covered. So the question of this uh, is, is NMT for all today, ready for all today? So we talked a lot about the 7,000 uh, language, and, uh, but what does it mean for, for language? For Europe, Europe is quite well, <laughs> well um, uh, equipped with machine translation. Uh, out of the 700 million people, 76% of the language are covered by the online machine translation you can find. But it's not the same for South East Asia, for instance, or for Africa, where you have coverage of the tools, the online tools that are very small, less than 20%, if you just look at the number of people. So 20% of the, of the people have tools for their own language. 
And I want to, to make a bigger dimension for language. We are talking about the language, Russian language, but there is more language. There is language of science, there is language of internet, language of chatting, the language of patents, and a lot more language. And if we look at all these languages, none of these are covered today by the online translation tools. And this might be an incentive you were asking to this morning, but what, ca what can we do for making the, the uh, NMT available for all languages? So this one, there might be an incentive because there is money behind. And so this, the developing of this language will help the developing of the regional language. So I want to say two words on the legacy technology and we heard about the rule base. Rule base is not dead. Uh, and rule base is really the, we want to describe language. But it is very costly and it is what our company and a lot of companies have tried to do for years with some benefit and some weakness. But it is really the human and the knowledge was in the human uh, the, the, what was bringing the linguist, the human, describing language. Then came the time of the statistical machine translation where the value was in the data. And it is big data, bigger data was more value. The only value was in the data. And the, with the new kid in the block, so the technology is still completely different. So uh, the, the idea is that it's vaguely inspired by human brain. And then the main point that it can learn uh, from translation example and automatically correct itself uh, and progressively improve. So at day zero, uh, minute zero, the machine, the machine translation for normal machine translation is already producing a translation. And, um, oops. and this new kid in the block has amazing ability that we cannot deny. So we can continuously learn. He can learn for six months. He will still be learning by reading what, what is on the internet. And Bert is one exact example of that. We can discover what the real linguists were trying to do, patterns in language, trying to generalize. We can leverage some knowledge from one language to uh, add translation for another language. And I think we'll learn more about that tomorrow. We can learn from monolingual and bilingual data. So there is, Im there is abilities that are amazing with this technology. And the trainer imagination is the boundary of this. With these abilities comes a lot of limitations too. And there is a lot of shortcomings and limitations that we have today on the technology side, but I won't insist on that. On the data, data must be available, and we heard about that this morning. Data must be of quality, and this is something that we don't discuss enough. We need also to understand that the NMT is very clever, but we'll just learn what humans are doing. So it will learn the human bias. And uh, there is a lot of human bias in text that you can find online. And this is very dangerous when we think about the consequences of that. But the last part that I want to emphasize is, the, is that uh, NMT is also something that is not very friendly, f f especially for the environment. We have all these tech companies, including mine, who are spending their time to use some GPU to make experiments on new data using the same algorithm, using data available online, and producing the same thing and saying that we have all the best technology while we are just burning energy to do exactly the same thing again and again. Just for a competition that is not worth anymore because technology is not anymore the competition. And if you want, if you're a small player, or if we are in uh, Ivory Coast and you want to publish a model, you cannot reach the web because if you want to publish a model that is web scale today, you need to be Google, Amazon, you need to have the coverage of the web that is enough to show that you have the technology. Even if you have the technology in house, to be able to expose the technology online, you cannot do that if you are by yourself. So, I just want to summarize the, the pillars of machine translation. There is a technology, but I don't talk about that because in some way there is a lot of people working on that and it's exciting, but we should not be considering that at all. There is the data that is critical and not all the data is open. There is the human expertise, the linguist we are talking about, the one that can read the translation, that can fix the data, that can continue to learning. And this one is the most valuable in the loop. And the infrastructure. Infrastructure is very critical. If you don't have it, you are not existing on the web today. So what we believe is that we need to go to a community-based approach where the big company, all the companies working on machine translation, will be putting together some standards. Uh, the same technology should be, should be exchangeable so you can be reverse the technology from one player to the other. 
do you need to put the local expertise at the center? The expert, the trainer, is the one who will be making the translation. We heard this morning about uh, Ms. Gordon, we are talking about, we do, should not forget about people that know the language because it's strategic. And indeed, if you want to, if you want to control language, you need at least to read the language. There is 7,000 languages, you need to have at least 7,000 people. It won't be one single company doing. It will be a collection of companies, a collection of individuals. And our responsibility, it could give them the tools to, 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 build, to, to build that, to make the available the, the infrastructure so that they can make their model all online. And the model needs to belong to the data owner and to the trainer. Because there is some ownership, there is some hard work to make a model, there is some hard work to produce data. And today we are just kind of ignoring that the web belongs, the website belongs to the people that put the, the, the website on. And all the websites have some IP that we are kind of forgetting. It is very important that the models belong to the one that has contributed to the model, and we are believing in that. And doing that, with that exchange, we also contribute a bit to that reduction of that greedy uh, um, uh, use of uh, GPU that uh, AI is using, because we'll be kind of, when you have trained the English, French, generic, then you can share that, and you can move to the next problem. You don't want to start from scratch and redo the, the, the again, the English, French by a new company that will say, we have the brand new, perfect technology that nobody has. And there is so many challenges that let us work on the next challenge. So, I just want to conclude on that, is that I started saying that machine translation was not a solution, it was a collection of tools. And it's, uh, we have this, this new kid that is able to learn language. We need definitely to use this kid. And the access needs to be given to the trainer, the local expert, the linguist, the translator, the data publisher, the, the one that have the technology. And we can think about the other application of machine translation. There is far more application that we can think about. Learning language is one of the challenges, one of the reasons we are using machine translation today, is that we want to learn language. We have this intelligent uh, technology, AI, that can learn by itself. Can it learn, help us learning the language? Can I learn some African language by myself with the, uh, learn of the, uh, with the help of this amazing technology? technology, then there will be a really a new achievement that will be done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jean. Uh, our next speaker will be uh, Sebastian Stücker from KIT, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, and he is also CEO of KITES GmbH in Karlsruhe. Um, you must imagine, you know, we spread a very broad domain here, and uh, now, as we talk about speech recognition and machine translation, they have been rather immature over 12 years ago. And so uh, Alex Weibel, who is in the progr program, and uh, Sebastian and a few uh, other folks uh, thought, why don't we combine these two technologies? And they have worked on this ever since. And uh, yeah, well, you'll talk about that, I assume. Yes, uh, a little bit. So thank you very much. Yes, so the title is um, Going the Extra Mile Towards Automatic Simultaneous Interpretation for All, and that contains a lot of uh, different topics. So uh, what I want to do um, uh, here is give you a short overview into the history of spoken language translation, and then specifically what do we mean by simultaneous translation, what is currently possible, what are the limitations, and especially what are the challenges for the many languages in them. And maybe um, we have a, a chance, maybe there is a, a possibility now that with the new technologies, we are actually in a position where we have now new possibilities of attacking the many languages and the long tail of languages. So um, spoken language translation, so when Alex Weibel started to work on it, uh, was in the late 80s, uh, and so the first, um, for example, speech translation video call was presented in 1991, 1992, um, within the Consortium for Speech Translation Advanced Research. Here you see a picture from a uh, demonstration where there was a video call being translated between three languages, the US, American uh, English, then in Japan, Japanese, and in uh, Germany, German, and it was a system that would translate consecutively. 
So it had a very limited vocabulary. It was um, uh, limited in what it could translate. It could not keep up in speed, but you would speak. It would take a, a while to process the data, and then you would get a translation, and then the other side could respond. So low speed, high latency were all limitations of these first systems, but they proved the uh, feasibility of actually not only translating text as it has, as it has been done before, uh, but also to translate uh, the spoken word. Um, uh, and then over the years and uh, decades, uh, research continued. Uh, there were many national, international uh, projects. There were projects in the US, in uh, Asia, in Germany. The European Union funded a lot of projects. So I've got a list here that is far from being complete. It's the uh, projects that I know about and I've been partially involved in. So that's what I, uh, why I put them here. But uh, for the people from Germany, uh, they know uh, Verbmobil as one of the first uh, and early German efforts in uh, developing spoken language translation systems, but then there were many European projects like Nespoli, TC Star, Ubridge. Um, there were American projects like Gale here in France. The, France there was the huge, huge effort done within Quero, where speech translation was a part of it, and the research continues as we uh, talk today. And with the progress in research, there was also um, a progress in designing products, and products started to appear on the market. And these products products essentially still had some of the limitations of the first demonstration systems. So they were turn-based. You would speak, you would have to wait, you would get the translation after a while, then the other side could respond, and they were limited in their domain. You had travel assistance, you had a hotel booking over the telephone, you know, all these small tasks that you needed to uh, bridge the uh, language barrier in. And of course, only very few languages were uh, addressed. It was always the languages where the funding was coming from, so English, English, German, Italian, Spanish, French, uh, sometimes uh, Arabic, so whenever the political uh, arena called for translation into a language that was funded. So these were the languages that were often addressed in these uh, um, projects, but it's far from uh, addressing all the languages that there are. Um, there were products on the market, so for Alex, for example, who developed uh, Jibigo, a translation system that then appeared on a uh, mobile phone and that would run on a mobile phone, and similar systems were also used for uh, humanitarian missions, so you would be uh, translating simple medical dialogues or the registration of patients in uh, uh, languages. This is from a uh, for medical missions from the uh, U.S. Army and in cooperation with the uh, Thai, uh, Thailand, um, the Army of Thailand, where they did these medical civil action programs, and there they um, showed that it is feasible to use these portable turn-based translation systems. There were also other modalities, so I said people would be experimenting with modalities. So translating does not only uh, involve the written text and the spoken word, it also involves um, the question of how do I present the output, so very often you have text as output, not so often spoken output, and even in 2005 there was experiments going on with uh, um, glasses where you would have the result projected into your eye or prominently the Google glasses that uh, also did the same or things like where you would have mobile devices to translate road signs. And then we took the step further and we actually want to do simultaneous uh, translation. So we want to do translation that is fast and low in latency in order to be able to uh, um, translate monologues like lectures, for example. This is what a, and we were motivated by uh, actually international students at KIT. So when an uh, international student comes to a lecture hall at KIT, that's exactly what he understands because we make an effort to teach in German. So when you come from abroad, you have to learn German in order to uh, actually understand anything. So we designed uh, a simultaneous translation uh, system in order to uh, bridge the gap here in that uh, scenario. And we presented the first prototype in 2000. 2005. We went productive in uh, 2012, ever since we've been running. But the languages, again, still are very limited. So we do the big five European languages, English, German, French, Italian, Spanish, and we also translate a little bit into Portuguese. But that is sort of currently the scope of uh, the number of languages that we address. Um, as you know, we are running it uh, test-wise here also in the uh, conference. So when you go to the uh, um, um, a website that's on the uh, um, little paper sheets that we handed out, you can take a look at the uh, translation and what the translation looks like. 
Um, it's again a web-based service uh, that runs uh, over the internet so it's not really portable you need an internet connection that fortunately over the last couple of years actually has become easier because now internet connections are available also in remote areas and you're not uh, you're very often in a situation where you can actually afford to have an internet connection for that. In that way, this is a, a burden that is, uh, is currently lifting on all these systems. The question is, of course, what do we do about the long tail of languages? So how can we actually take the extra step so that we're not bound to the languages where we can afford to collect a lot of data or where a lot of data is available um, and can be used for training the systems. What about the uh, many languages that don't have that much data, that don't have that much uh, many speakers, where there's not necessarily a, an, an economic incentive of co in covering these languages. Um, so Google already um, presented this morning and Facebook and Amazon some of their uh, efforts in uh, dealing with this problem. We're looking at it from a research point of view. So we've been actually looking at the problem for quite a couple of decades now. How can we service many languages at low costs so that it is actually feasible? And low cost means not only low costs in terms of money but also in human effort. So. Of course, you try to collect data, you try to collect data in many languages, and there are many efforts in collecting these kinds of databases, but then you also look at how can you optimize all the human effort in developing a system. So you want to have your auto model trainer where you don't have five PhD students or five uh, researchers sitting there that uh, work on a, on a model for half a year and then you get something out. Instead, you want to have the auto uh, train bot, uh, button. And um, so there are and then the last step is what do you do if you don't have much data, then you look at transfer-based approaches, for example, so you ask yourself, how can you transfer languages where you have a lot of the few languages where if you're if you're not lucky, you might not have much data or any data at all. It might be difficult to even get a test set or development set in order to um, work with it. So the question is, can we, for example, learn incrementally? So break through this paradigm of train first, then deploy. Instead, train, deploy, and keep on learning while you're deployed. Learn from interactions that you have while you are, as a system, are being deployed, while you observe what's going on in the real world. So we want to learn incrementally and interactively. And um, we are fortunate in one sense that we have uh, entered the age of neural spoken language translation now. You might argue it could be a problem because these neural models are very data hungry. They need a lot of data to be trained. That is true. But at the same time, they now offer new uh, possibilities of actually adapting with little data to new tasks. Things like BERT or uh, the other networks actually have shown that it is possible if you train on a certain task with a lot of data, you can easily adapt this model to a new task with very little data. And the same is uh, true with uh, uh, machine translation and automatic speech recognition. You train on one language, your neural model, it learns a lot, and then you just need to tweak a little in order to adapt yourself to the uh, new language. And in order, in order to be able to do that, for example, one of the efforts is in looking into these continuous representation that tries to capture what is in a language, what describes a language, what is the essence of a language. For automatic speech recognition, we have something we call language feature vectors, where you essentially, in an unsupervised manner, you just take the data that you know comes from one language, you have, a, have an auxiliary task, for example, language identification that gives you a network where you take out a model network uh, a layer in the middle and then this bottleneck layer is sort of a continuous representation of what characterizes the language that's currently uh, put into the network in the beginning and then you have this information that is basically a representation of the concept of that language I, similar to how we might have it in our biological brain and you give this as an extra information to your models to your newer models and the newer models hopefully and seem to be able now to adapt themselves based on this 
a vector of numbers that describes the language that we as humans cannot necessarily interpret, but the machine can actually get out of it the information of how to treat a new language by just adapting itself a little bit, by just having a little bit of training data. And it goes so far that, for example, in machine translation, it's now possible to train models that translate language directions that they've never seen during training. So if during training you have seen, for example, uh, English, uh, French, and German, uh, German, Spanish, you now can also translate English to Spanish, even though you haven't seen Spanish. And the hope is that we are now able to even expand on that and maybe get even more out of it. And I think the most salient point why that might work is actually in this continuous representation that, for example, for machine translation and for speech recognition, maybe not so much, maybe it's something different, seems to capture something like semantics but not necessarily in a symbolic manner, but in a continuous manner as a continuous vector that you, we as humans might not be able to interpret, but that can be learned in an unsupervised almost manner and then can be used to uh, do things like machine translation, speech recognition or other natural language processing tasks on new languages with very little training data. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sebastian. A topic that is typically overlooked by the people around me doing speech recognition is prosody because it's difficult to capture in the current approaches and I'm happy to hear uh, about the topic uh, from uh, Ajun Li. She is professor at the Institute of Linguistics, uh, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, China. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, a presentation title is the handling prosting in Tong uh, languages. So this is the outline. The first is the challenge for handling prosody and tone languages. So as we all know, the speech is a multi-layer medium in interactive communication. It transmits linguistic information such as the tone, lexical stress, sentence type, focus, and uh, the phone. And also the paralinguistic information such as the attitude, emotion, intention, dialect, and also uh, even the uh, non-linguistic information, just as your uh, health state and your gender and your age. So all these are closely related to the intonation and prosody. So what is tone? Tone can be defined as pitch variation that change uh, either the lexical or grammatical meaning of a word. Nearly uh, 60 to 17 percent languages are tone languages. So the, most of the language in Africa, they, uh, uh, belongs to the registered tone languages. Uh, they use the uh, uh, tonal, uh, the page height to, uh, as a cue of the word and uh, of the word meaning. And uh, most of the uh, languages spoken in uh, East Asia uh, belongs to the contour tone languages. They use the uh, page uh, movement uh, to distinguish the uh, uh, word meaning. And what is prosody? Prosody is sometimes used as a synonym only for intonation, which, refer, which refers to use super segmental features to convey post lexical or sentence level programmatic meanings in linguistic. Could the interpreters please ask the speaker to speak more slowly, please? Showed here that when the tones are combined together, uh, they will be influenced by the neighboring tone called the, the tone cardiogenation. But when the tone is changed, could the speaker please be asked to slow down? Uh, intonation uh, can be influenced uh, by the information structure. Uh, here in the middle figure shows that uh, the, the green one is the intonation for the initial focus one, and the, the red one is for the media focus intonation. Also, the intonation uh, can be uh, influenced by uh, your expression or different emotions. So, uh, we are facing a lot of challenges in handling processing and tone languages from a scientific point of view. Uh, uh, you can uh, go to my submitted paper uh, for more detailed information, uh, but here... The interpreters ask to speak a little slower. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So, uh, I just want to focus on tone and the intonation. Uh, so regarding the tone theory and modeling, and 
there are uh, usually two kind of uh, uh, views. One is called superimposed or superpositional model. And uh, uh, this model assumes the intonation contour uh, can be uh, decomposable into different layers or uh, components. Uh, the examples like the uh, uh, wire jaws uh, intonation theory to look at intonation, uh, the Chinese intonation as the uh, uh, small ripples uh, uh, on the large waves. And another one is the Fujisaki model and to combine the uh, uh, phrase command with the uh, tone or pitch accent uh, command. Um, and another view is called the linear models, uh, such as the British nuclear tone tradition and the uh, issues Penta model and the auto segmental matrix uh, intonation theory model uh, belongs to this part. And uh, so uh, the figures show that uh, for the AM uh, theory that uh, uh, they uh, consider the contour of the intonation and uh, it consists of the three parts, uh, the pitch accent, the freeze accent, and the boundary tone. So based on all of these uh, intonation theories um, that uh, the transcription system for the intonation or PROSD uh, uh, were proposed. Uh, the popular one is the uh, uh, TOBI, uh, which is used to uh, transcribe the uh, PROSD or intonation for the English. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, a lot of TOBI-like systems were also proposed, including the Chinese Toby system. And another one is uh, proposed by Daniel Hurst and called the Instant, which is an international transcription system uh, for different language intonation. So uh, nowadays, uh, as we know, there's a lot of uh, uh, men, uh, men and uh, machine interaction systems. So the uh, in, uh, contextual Prousy need to be modeled by considering the context or discourse information uh, and by using uh, the machine learning or the deep learning uh, uh, technologies. So this work shows that uh, on the uh, question detection by uh, integrate the uh, segmental and the uh, super segmental features uh, into the uh, CNN and use the uh, um, bidirectional LSTM model to uh, model the context information. Uh, and this work is on the emphasize detection for the uh, dialogue uh, system. And also, uh, uh, they propose uh, uh, multi-channel CNN uh, to model the uh, acoustic features uh, in a, a, a very higher level and uh, to use the double BLSTM model to model the context information. And this work is on the handling tone proxy in speech synthesis by using a toggle string of uh, very popular end-to-end -end model for multi-language synthesis. Uh, so this uh, shows that uh, for the uh, a low resource a language like the Tibetan, that the uh, uh, tone information or prosody information uh, uh, will give uh, uh, super help. Um, please uh, play the sound here. And uh, I'll play two sound here uh, to show you the performance. Okay, uh, the baseline. So you, you can hear that the performance uh, difference between the original one and the, the one uh, which consider the tone uh, features here. Uh, so this is the performance for uh, since that's the uh, Japanese uh, piece. So this one is the performance for since this one is the one that uh, we are uh, uh, So uh, the first one is the middle one that we uh, uh, consider the pitch accent of the preserved word information in the system. And another one is the uh, uh, original one. Uh, so the last work is on the speech replication. Uh, refers to the uh, reproduction of the basic feature of the speech for dialect or language, specifically for the uh, endangered 
dialect or language. And uh, uh, the framework of this system uh, uh, integrates the uh, speech recognition, uh, machine translation, and speech synthesis. So um, when this system is established, uh, you can input the, both the uh, uh, text of the reference language or the speech of the reference language, and you get the output of the uh, target language. So when the target language um, disappears, uh, you can even use the system to interact with the uh, target or disappeared language. So this is a uh, success the sound uh, that we are uh, working for an endangered language called Sibo in China. Okay, thank you, that's all. Thank you very much. Um, another topic often overlooked is that we cover industry-wise several languages, but often not the dialectal variants within these languages. And so I'm happy to hear Ahmed Ali talk, a, a principal engineer at Qatar Computing Research Institute, Hamad Bel Khalifa University in Qatar, to talk about that topic. Good afternoon. Um, so the topic today will be dialectal speech processing. I thought to give examples from what we have been up to in Arabic, then you know you put it in, in practice. So before I talk, I'll try to show a demo for what we are doing. So if you can switch to the. If you can start. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Shukran li da'wati li hudur hadha al-mu'tamar. Ashkur al-diyuf al-kiram ala hudurihum la'ard ba'd injazat ma'had qatar li buhuth al-hawsaba khasatan fi majal taqniyat al-lugha al-arabiyya. كما ترون أتكلم في الميكروفون فيتم التعرف على الكلام وتحويله إلى نص مكتوب وعرضه على الشاشة وكذلك ترجمته إلى اللغة الإنجليزية بشكل آني كما ترون أني أتحدث بسرعة تطوير هذا البرنامج تم للتعامل مع اللغة العربية الفصحى وكذلك أيضا طورناه للتعامل يكون بشكل أفضل مع بعض اللهجات الشائعة مثل اللهجة الشامية واللهجة المصرية واللهجة الخليجية واللهجة المغربية شكرا لكم وأتمنى لكم يوما سعيدا So basically, that's uh, um, what we have been doing for a speech translation. Um, uh, I'll highlight some of the facts and challenges that we have been up to in, in the Arabic system. Um, so how do I switch slides? Okay, so um, the work has been done in QCRI, which is a research institute in Qatar, in Doha. Basically, we look at four challenges. One of them is Arabic language technologies. Um, so why Arabic is important? Because it's a language spoken by more than 400 native speakers. However, um, we are all assuming that Arabic is one language. So let me ask you a question. Is Arabic a language or a suite of languages? So we all assume it's a language. If you look here, you will see Arabic, right? It's just one language. Good. So when you look at this, what do you say? It's a tomato, right? or it could be tomato. So this word has uh, one lexical variation. You can write it in one way, but you can uh, spell it in two different ways. That's in English. Let us look at this example in Arabic. This shows you 10 different ways to write Arabic. And if you would like to go a little bit further, you can see if you would evaluate uh, the word error rate or the character error rate between these 10 variations, you could get an average 60% character error rate. However, in English, it's one, one pronunciation, two, uh, one, uh, one lexical variation, two, um, two pronunciation. Then if you look at how to pronounce it, there's a 15 way to pronounce the word tomato in Arabic. So there's an average 80% phoneme error rate between the different variation in pronouncing tomato in Arabic. This can give you an, um, a feeling of how variant is, is dialects in, in Arabic uh, compared to um, uh, language like English. So with this, you know, what's the definition between language and dialect? Um, um, the, 
the political definition when you give the dialect an army or navy, it's a language, but you know, computer science look at it differently or a linguistic view. If two people are able to understand each other, it's, um, it's a dialect. However, when you put Arabic in context, you would say it's actually it's a language with many, with many navies and armies. But now you get my point of what's, what's the challenge in, in Arabic. Okay, so uh, for, I mean, some of the challenges in speech recognition is the large vocabulary, um, the variant in speakers, the acoustic environment, the style of talking. So as you have seen, you know, I mean, talking in a very clean environment, very close microphone, I speak quietly, the room is, uh, is not noisy, etc. That's why you are able to understand, uh, hopefully me, reasonably. The machine at least were able to understand me. Now, okay, so this is how we do speech recognition. We take the acoustic signal, we digitize it, and we try to align with the word, and here we try to recognize the word al Arabiya. How we evaluate the speech recognition by, by looking at the number of insertion, deletion, substitution, which is, you know, very simple. Uh, Again, the interpreters ask the speaker to speak more slowly, please. Perhaps in Arabic, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a slightly different. So, um, uh, the field of speech recognition has been moving very fast. Uh, a couple of years ago, IBM and Microsoft had uh, a couple of papers saying that we have reached human parity, which is human parity is 5.5%, 5.1%, but you get the point that it's, uh, it has gone um, very well, so the problem looks like it has been solved. So we learned it the same from, from, uh, from the English, and we built very sophisticated models where we reach it now 13% word error rate, and you have seen the system yourself. It's able to recognize my Arabic, and with a bit of luck, you were able to realize what I'm trying to say even in English. A little slower for the uh, okay, I'll try to speak slower, which is a bit difficult. I always speak very fast. Uh, so that's a 13% word error rate which means the problem is very good and it happens because we keep adding more data and we release recently more than a thousand hours, make the models more sophisticated and we build a, a robust speech system. The idea simple is that when you, the machine learning these days, you give it more data, it learns from data and get more better and robust. But again, it's not, uh, it's not scalable as has been mentioned earlier today, you cannot do this for all languages. So another um, aspect of this, we have taken the speech recognition and we link it with the natural language processing and even live when you are talking, we can recognize your voice, we can translate it and we can extract the natural language, the natural language processing features such as segmentation, uh, uh, punctuation, uh, vowelization, which is add the critics to, uh, to the text. Now, we have been talking and we have been working in SUMA project with our colleagues in the BBC and uh, Deutsche Bella and Al Jazeera in applying our fantastic models in the wild. So let us see what's happening in media monitoring, in YouTube. And uh, if you look at the third column, these numbers are quite high. Unfortunately, this is a word error rate, this is not accuracy. So we see there are cases like Morocco, Khalid can explain more, we are getting into 90%. There are cases like Lebanese, we are getting 70%. There are cases where we are getting 80%. So although we claim we have 13% in what we call the language, which is Arabic, but actually we have done quite well in a specific domain in modern standard Arabic. So why, why dialectal Arabic is, um, is, is challenging compared to Let's put the context in English, because uh, word, um, word uh, order freedom, it can go any way. You can start by the verb, you can start by the noun. Morphologically ambiguous, the language, you can use examples like um, uh, love and seed has the same lexical of, of writing. Uh, resources is, is, is very much under resource when you speak about dialectal. And the other interesting aspect is dialect diarization which doesn't exist in language like English. So you wouldn't find someone in English go between British English to American English to Canadian English. But in Arabic, someone can be switching from Egyptian to MSA, for example, which is something uh, unusual to see um, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in languages like, uh, like English. Now, what we have done, we look at samples of the text, in dialectal text, and we ask four people to transcribe it, you know. So in English, it's all known that enough is E-N-O-U-G-H. It cannot be E-N-U-F because the reason is because there's an Oxford, there is a Beeb, there is a lexicon, there is a correct spelling. But dialectal Arabic actually, do we have a correct spelling? So this is an experiment that shows um, uh, uh, 
transcription house could look at Egyptian data and come with an average 20% word error rate. So if you're on a perfect system, on the Egyptian data, you get a 20% word error rate because people among themselves, they don't agree. Then how do you evaluate the machine if you cannot get the people to agree? So basically, we look at it as a language with no standard orthographic rules. So if you think 20% uh, is high, uh, that's a baseline for this, is about 60% word error rate. You look at, uh, we look at Moroccan. Now we take it to wild, actually. The 50% word error rate amongst um, five uh, native speakers who are linguists working on the data because people use lots of French words and there's no clear definition. How would they write it? They write it in French or in Arabic words, etc. Oh, cool. So um, this is an um, example of what we have been doing in, in Arabic. So we can say here, the past, I mean, the way we are looking at it in Arabic is we have been looking at dialectal as an under-resourced language. Recently, we are trying to look at it as semi-supervised distance supervision, where we are trying to learn from MSA, Middle and Standard Arabic, and apply it on dialectal Arabic. And hopefully the future is, is if we can do unsupervised and go without the need to label data, because the experiment that we were able to get 1,000 hours of MSA, we cannot do this across all the the dialects. Um, so I will skip lots of slides because I have one minute. I, you know. Uh, so that's um, an experiment from what I've been doing into uh, dialect identification across um, Arabic um, um, uh, dialects. So we look at it. Initially, we thought we could look at Arabic as five dialects, the five regions, but then we started to complicate the problem where we look at each country itself as a dialect, and uh, hopefully there is um, a room to go into more fine-grained and get, um, get per country or per, per, uh, per lower, um, uh, smaller um, uh, uh, geographical location. So that's about the evaluation, which is, again, I have no time. Uh, yeah, okay. So basically, this is the last, uh, topic. So we have been doing a great progress with Arabic, but what we have done is not enough. And we think the biggest challenge why there is a good work in Arabic for a couple of years and then disappear and good work because we have seen DARPA, which was a great project, fund and lots of researchers, great researchers have invested good work in Arabic and improved the state of the art. And then there was a SUMA project, which is EU fund. Now we are trying to build a research um, committee and uh, it's a community effort to, to build, um, uh, to make Arabic speech processing great again. And our, we have lots of colleagues from JHU, from Amazon, from uh, Nuance, from Microsoft, from Google, from Edinburgh University leading this. We try to meet once a year. We look at dialectal Arabic and modern standard Arabic. And uh, we held the first meeting last year in Doha. And uh, hopefully we invite all of you guys for the, our meeting in April 2021 in Doha again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. If normal people of my age hear Roger Moore, they think of an actor, but our Roger Moore in speech recognition is standing in front of you. He is a professor at the University of Sheffield, a professor of spoken language processing, and he, in particular in the last years, has looked into, say, non-standard topics. And <laughs> I'm curious to hear what you have to say No. Thank you. Thank you, Volker. And um, a good afternoon, everybody. And a particular thanks to the organizers who invited me to uh, address this, what I can now see as a very, very important event in our community. So I'm going to be talking about something perhaps a little bit different, but it will connect with, if you were here this morning, you heard Amit talking about robots. So I'm also going to be talking about robots, and I'm going to be focusing on some of the issues that we face if we're, if we're considering this option. But before I fo look forward, I want to just look back a bit just to remind you that we have a very, very long history of talking with technology now going way back to the 1970s when we had very simple systems deployed. But there was a very significant event in uh, 2011 when Siri first appeared on the Apple iPhone in, in, in the US and the UK, um, where people suddenly uh, ordinary people were realizing that there was such a technology and could now use it to get things done using their voices. 
So that's kind of where we are now with uh, Siri and Alexa and equivalents. But looking forwards, people in the research community, some of whom are here, are looking at uh, embodied conversational agents. So these are like avatars that might appear on, on your screen. So characters which you might interact with. But what I'm going to be talking about, uh, the community who are looking way further ahead, where we might be interacting with autonomous social agents, by which we mean robots. Okay, so why, uh, why robots at all? Before we start talking with them, why, why are robots potentially very important? Well, um, there's a very long story here, but I just want to simply draw attention to one word on this slide, which is automation. In the end, it's about automation. Creating uh, artifacts that make our lives easier, save money, all kinds of things, all the really nice buzz phrase that people use to do things that are dirty, difficult, dangerous, or just plain dull. Uh, and improve the quality of life. So this is why there is a great, great interest in robots right now. So what is a robot? Um, and one of the first developers, pioneers of robotics way back uh, in the 1900s, uh, um, I can't define a robot, but I do know one when I see one. So let's look at a, uh, an act. There are now many definitions, but this is a really good one. A robot is an actuated mechanism programmable in two or more axes with a degree of autonomy moving within its environment to perform intended tasks. So here's a bunch of artifacts. So let's see how they line up with this kind of definition. So first of all, we need to focus on this. Actuated mechanism moving within its environment. And that immediately knocks out Siri, Google Home, uh, and Alexa. These are not robots by this definition. So they're interesting voice-based uh, artifacts, but they're not really robots. Uh, now let's pick on this word autonomy. So um, you'll notice here we've got an, a drone. Uh, so all of these are potentially things you might want to talk to, but a drone uh, which is remote controlled doesn't have autonomy. So that is not strictly speaking a robot. So we have here a bunch of different uh, artifacts, um, some of which you may recognize. We've got an industrial robot, Pepper, which is quite popular, the vacuum cleaner. Um, these are indeed robots, the sort of things that we might want to interact with using our voice. And you'll see we've got a character on the left who's left standing. Uh, now this, is, this character here will appear, I can guarantee, in every media-based article on robotics. And it is not a robot, it is a fiction. It is somebody's imagination, it's appeared in a film and Amit mentioned this. And this is an area we have to be very, very careful of. There's a, a blurring between science fiction, fantasy, and the reality that's in our laboratories right now. And this is becoming quite dangerous because of people's uh, expectations of what the technology may or may not do. And their expectations may be quite negative. So we have to be very careful about that. I'm going to come back to that. So, okay, so now we know what a robot is. Why, why, would we, why would we want to talk to a robot anyway? So let's break that down a little bit. Um, so let's identify three domains where we might want to use our voice to interact with uh, a physical device such as a robot. So there's the physical, physical world of stuff and things, objects, actions. There's the social world of agents and relations between them. And then there's the abstract world of concepts, information, and data. And robots uh, span all of these different areas. We've got a few examples here. So there's a whole bunch of issues, uh, not, not, not issues, a, a, bunch of, a bunch of opportunities here where we, we can ask the question, why would we want to use our voice in these situations? So in the physical world, a very good reason for wanting to talk to a robot, an artifact, is because it frees up our hands and it frees up our eyes. So if you're drive, piloting a vehicle, for example, then the voice provides an, an additional channel. We can also do interesting multimodal things with our voice and with actions because the, in, in the physical world, we exist physically not as well as uh, linguistically, as it were. So managing joint attention, uh, simultaneous gesture, speaking, which, and this opens up the possibility, for example, to work collaborative, collaboratively with a physical device. So we might be coordinating behavior between a bunch of real people and a bunch of robots in order to achieve some task. So that's in the physical domain. In the social domain, then we have the possibility of entering into relationships. Companionships was mentioned by uh, companionship was mentioned by Amit this morning, or creating sort of empathy between uh, agents, uh, synthetic agents, and actual people. 
uh, and then in the abstract world, we now we're getting into the, something very, very interesting where we, the power of language itself starts to become manifest because we've got an incredibly high uh, information rate channel which can be used to express very, very abstract ideas um, in a way that uh, other channels such as gesture and just pushing physically, uh, pressing buttons, operating screens doesn't give us uh, access to that kind of information rate. So those are all the things that might um, be good. But then there's a lot of challenges which the research community is looking at and have to be o uh, overcome because if you have a physical robot then it is sitting in a physical environment and everyday environments are incredibly challenging. So we just all were out uh, having lunch just a moment ago and just imagine if we'd had robots in that space with us trying to interact, trying to engage, uh, trying to figure out who's who, where everybody is, how to butt into a conversation in a socially acceptable way, how to know that somebody's actually addressing the robot. All these are major, major challenges which people are working on and require some serious uh, uh, solutions and, and you'll notice that I haven't men mentioned the most obvious one which is it's incredibly noisy and so uh, dealing with that which you and I with with our amazing auditory apparatus can solve we don't ne yet know how to do that with, with robots. Another area where, where um, uh, I have a particular interest is when we put robots in, in a space with human beings people do have rather interesting reactions to them and there's this famous notion of the uncanny valley where a robot which is particularly human like uh, is you would think making a human robot would be a good thing in, in principle but as you as you construct robots which are more like humans um, then people have very, very negative reactions. So, for example, this curve, which you can see here, the uncanny valley, an industrial robot is just fine. Um, a real human being is considered to be very, uh, uh, you get a good reaction. Um, if we've got sort of toy humanoid robots or, or actual toys, people again are quite happy with that. But down here, where we've got a, this is a robot, um, and I've chosen one, of course, which does engender particularly negative reactions. But this is not just about having a funny face or an awkward face. It turns out that if you combine the wrong voice with the wrong body, with the, you know, the wrong behaviors, that creates this kind of negative potential and people will react negatively and walk away. So that's an important area. Another big area is, uh, as has been mentioned this morning, I think, although we have fantastic solutions for uh, recognizing speech and generating speech, we have very little on the uh, most important aspect of it all, which actually understanding what people are trying to achieve. Uh, so it's not just about what people say, it's what are they trying to do uh, with their voices. And this is going to be particularly important if we're interacting with agents such as robots in a real environment. Now, interestingly, precisely because robots exist in the real world and therefore are ground, have a, a grounded experience and are situated in the real world, that potentially opens up a possibility of doing some really good research in that area to try to break through uh, and get a real grip on what we mean by understanding at all. And then the final two challenges are, are, are um, in some sense, a little trivial, but um, we mustn't forget that robots are very complex machines and they're not made to the same kind of specification that a lot of the technology that we're used to dealing with. So they are fragile, um, they are electrical, the computers can fail, the network can fail, all kinds of things can go wrong. And as I like to say, if ever you visit a robot lab, the first thing you will hear from whoever's showing you around is an apology that most of the robots aren't working that day. And then finally, robots, because they're a, a machine and a specialized machine right now, are incredibly expensive. Um, and so that is a big question mark over the uh, ubiquitous deployment of these kinds of devices. And then I just want to finish on um, something which is uh, growing in uh, hugely in importance, which is the, uh, some of the ethical issues that revolve around all this. I'm sure you're well aware that already with Alexa and Siri and what have you, we've got uh, privacy issues. Uh, these devices are listening. Of course, they're listening for the wake word, but nevertheless, they are listening. And they're listening all the time, and they're sitting in our homes, they may be sitting in our children's bedrooms, and people are getting rightly very concerned about that. There are trust issues. If we're giving autonomous agents, uh, such as a robot, some responsibility, uh, who, who, who ultimately 
who ultimately is responsible when things go wrong. And indeed, we also have fabrication problems. There was a famous case of, of some robots which are, are not real at all, some, some, some guy sitting in a costume pretending uh, to, to be a robot, which leads to the whole area of hype which, which revolves around this and the overselling of the potential and uh, the claims that are made about uh, demonstrations of what may or may not be possible often way exceed where we are uh, realistically in laboratories and we have to be, as a community, very, very careful about how this whole uh, technology is portrayed. So that's uh, where I want to finish. If you're interested in some of the details there, there's a, a chapter in, in a book called Robots That Talk and Listen, which you can, you can get online, um, as well as the paper that's in this proceedings. And that's where I'll finish. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. The last presentation will be given by uh, Thomas Hanke. Uh, he currently works at the Institute of German Sign Language and Communication of the Deaf, University of Hamburg. Uh, Thomas heads the Academy of Science long-term project creating a large-scale annotated corpus of German Sign Language. Please. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Oops. Oops. Uh, can you go fast? Okay, so I thought I'd first give a very brief introduction to sign languages. Um, sign languages are natural languages used by the deaf communities. They are languages in their own right being very different from spoken languages with equally complex, complex grammar systems, variation, language change, whatever you can think of. There's no universal sign language, but, culturally bound, but they are culturally bound, which means most countries have their own, sometimes even more than one, sign language. So I'm not talking about auxiliary sign systems such as uh, speech taboo languages. In the context of this conference, one might ask, uh, are sign languages indigenous languages, um, as they are Nowhere in the world so sign languages are national majority languages. One might think, yes, many are by definition, but most researchers only talk about indigenous uh, sign languages when it comes to sign languages used by the deaf uh, members of indigenous uh, peoples. Hello. Instead, we, we talk about the differences between urban and village sign languages. Urban sign languages uh, are more or less national sign languages, also used in educational settings by deaf people and their families, friends, teachers, etc. The average figure often quoted uh, is one out of thousand being deaf as an estimate how many deaf signers there are in a country. Multiply that with three to have the number of uh, sign language users in that country. Village sign languages, on the other hand, are languages that evolve where the rate of deafness uh, is that high that, sh is, is that signing is shared between deaf and hearing members of the community. De Niece in 2018 lists 30 living village uh, sign languages. Glottolog names 54, so the number doesn't really matter. Um, in any case, village sign languages are most fascinating for researchers to see a language evolve uh, from early on in a rather rapid development. And of course, all of these village sign languages can be considered to be highly endangered. Urban sign languages, uh, Glottolog lists 135 um, uh, and endangerment, as you know, often is a question um, of definition used for political reasons. As it is medical progress endangering sign languages, you can imagine that this is a highly emotional topic within deaf communities. Now coming to the mm, language technologies. Substantial work on language technologies is currently going on on less than 20 urban sign languages. So, 
Here I focus on three areas that are special with sign languages, corpus data, sign language output, and sign recognition. Let us start with sign language corpora. As you do not find reliable resources of sign language data, you have to produce your own, um, as we did in Hamburg. So you invite people to talk to each other in the studio, giving them topics to discuss. On the right, you see my favorite task uh, that we used in Hamburg, traffic signs unknown to most people, uh, provoking speculation about the meaning of these uh, signs and um, things like negation. On the left, you see the camera perspectives that, uh, that we recorded. Even the basic steps like segmentation and lemmatization are still time-consuming manual work, as no Latin sign language in the world has an established writing system. So research has to rely on gloss systems using another language, and you know what that implies for research. So small. The German Sign Language Corpus has uh, 450 hours uh, of uh, video data from 330 informants, of which uh, 50 hours are now publicly available with annotation. That is 350,000 tokens that the largest corpus published. The largest corpus probably existing is uh, uh, the one on Polish Sign Language with uh, claimed uh, 700,000 uh, tokens, uh, but nothing published so far. Okay, let's come to sign generation. In most systems that uh, try to produce sign language output, uh, they use avatars, and here you see a plethora of them. Uh, so it's more a Babel problem uh, than sparsity. The problem, however, is that most uh, projects uh, did not reach the state where the avatars could pr produce something readable. So most of these things do not work. Here on the other hand is a system that does work. This is uh, on the high end, uh, motion capture um, data such as this um, from mocap lab in Paris. Oops. <laughs> okay, very short. Um, the disadvantages of that, uh, such a system are obvious. Cost of equipment, the time needed for post-processing, difficult to retarget, and of course you have to, uh, to wear reflective markers on the body, so it's not the most natural environment for a signer. Synthetic signing, on the other hand, is... Um, <laughs> um, so the, the low cost um, other end of the spectrum, um, here you would see, if you could see more than the squares, um, the Hamburg notation system, uh, which is often said to be the IPA for sign languages, and I give you an example of how that looks like. So the effort to create this is less than 30 seconds by simply typing. And that system is used around the world uh, in a number of projects as, is, as it is easy to use uh, to have a start on sign language technologies. I believe that the future lies in hybrid systems uh, that use mocap and handcrafted animation in combination with synthetic sign to improve the quality of signing avatars while keeping costs down. Okay, let's look into the other direction, sign recognition. Uh, here you see two examples of uh, the BSL, Bridge Sign Language Sign for Different, um, and the traditional approach was tracking the hands and the face over time, then shape recognition, hopefully without gloves. Open polls from Carnegie Mellon University is an example of deep learning which completely changed the picture for us. The great thing about OpenPose is that it translates a computer vision problem 
into a classification task on time series data much more accessible to linguists. Therefore, more people or more sign languages can now start working on automatic data analysis without the need for large uh, interdisciplinary teams. That is especially important if you think about village sign languages um, where it is often a single researcher working on that language. So, why do we really need um, language technologies for sign languages? So almost all sign language users are, bi are bilingual to a certain extent. You might think, oh, why can't they switch to a better resourced language? Of course, just ignoring the, the human right to use the preferred language. If you think about human computer interfaces, it's no big problem with uh, current graphical user interfaces for deaf people. Um, and um, yeah, they would have problems with reading manuals, but that's very old fashioned anyway. No one does it anymore. So why are they disadvantaged? Yeah, let's come back to Siri, Alexa and co, uh, which might change the picture. When human computer interaction shifts to natural language communication, this might be a bit big step forward for, for many, but deaf users might be mm, deprived if such a natural language interface does not include sign language. So our claim is Siri, Alexa and Co should definitely learn sign language. <coughs> Anonymization is another reason that is becoming more and more an issue in the deaf communities. You should be able to express yourself on the web without becoming visible in a video. So this brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Thomas. And uh, I hand over to Ximena, who is uh, managing the uh, question round, questions and answers, podium discussion. Uh, yes, so if anyone of the attendees have a question, we have a time. We are running a bit late, so we have around 20 minutes for discussion and questions. Everyone is shy. Shall I start with a warm-up question? So, as, as I have the opportunity to have uh, uh, renowned experts here who have been around for a while, at least 10 years, I would say, maybe everybody could just mention one or two things that have really surprised him or her, because, you know, a lot of stuff is just things are getting better, research is getting richer, so, but then there are surprises on the way. What were the things that surprised you? So something obvious, so AI definitely surprised us, but what is even more surprising is that with AI we are rediscovering linguistic today. We can, with an unsupervised system today, rediscover what linguists have been learning for, learning for, for many centuries, so it's incredible. So a AI be meaning uh, deep neural networks and machine learning and... What surprises me is how poor our evaluation metrics are so far. We haven't got that right. Maybe that's a negative, but it's still surprising. <laughs> you please? Well, I'm really surprised that uh, neural networks and machine translation actually work the way that they work, that we are now essentially able to bridge this gap between the uh, symbolic sequence in which we as humans also express speech, so the symbolic sequence of words, into this continuous sequence that the network learns. And at the same time, what surprises me is that if I think about it, that is actually something that we humans naturally do, that we switch between the symbolic representation that we use to communicate, and then somewhere in our skull there seems to be this continuous representation that we think with. And that that now is possible with neural networks, I found very surprising. 
So uh, I think the uh, AI technology is um, a tool way to help the uh, as the researchers or uh, from the uh, technology part. Uh, the, when we uh, use the, uh, uh, the technology, it helps to uh, 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 it helps us to um, make uh, the further uh, understanding of the uh, nature of the uh, languages. And on the other hand, uh, the, uh, we, when we use the uh, uh, technology that uh, uh, we can uh, 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 look at deeper into uh, other parts like the uh, recognition, uh, uh, like the cognition of the uh, language. So that's the uh, uh, surprise to me uh, of the AI uh, technology. Okay, um, I have two things which surprise me. Uh, one is about over 10 years ago, I w was giving talks uh, projecting how much data we would need to train uh, automatic speech recognition. And the, uh, what I was uh, concluding was we needed like 100,000 hours or something. And I was giving this talk with a view to people not pursuing the data option. However, <laughs> it turns out uh, I, I seem to, the, the, the community has in, in, in fact said, okay, let's go ahead, let's just take the most enormous amount of data and see what we can do. And what's surprising is you can do a lot with an awful lot of data if you have it. The second thing is a, a cheap shot. I'm surprised how few people know what the proper definition of the word phoneme is. <laughs> and uh, can I just uh, draw your attention to a paper that I had in Interspeech recently um, which seems to be quite popular in the community uh, and maybe we can start to distinguish between the real use of that word and its importance for creating communicative artifacts and not use it in a superficial way. What surprises me is that, um, yeah, it's not only with, um, with neural uh, networks, but also with many other kinds of technologies where you think uh, they had the time and uh, they disappeared and all of a sudden they reappear and open new uh, possibilities. Yes. Yeah, myself, Nicholas. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. We are talking on the language tool for all. And thanks for all the presentations. We are here from different uh, universities, different companies, researchers. Uh, but listening in the morning hours and now, now, I have a feeling that are we not moving from the humanity to the age of machines and tools? Uh, so we'll be one day learning without, depending on the whole machines and tools, and how we will express. Now, suppose I like to sing a song, I like to dance. How all these things, uh, the, the, so my mind, how they will experience? this type of absence of real humanity, you know, the joy and love and affection that I enjoy in the community. So that's a, I feel the dichotomy between the humanity and the machine and tools. How do you see? Please. Let, I'll try to give a little bit of an uh, idea that we've been discussing recently and we've also been discussing it at the uh, European uh, Commission in the consultation meetings when it comes to uh, preparing the new uh, research program. So what we're doing here, for example, in machine translation is we are doing something that one could describe as a, sim as a simulation. We are trans trying to translate a uh, symbolic word sequence, but that's not what you want to do. What you really want to do is you want to do 
dissemination. So you want to express something, not only in words, but with all modalities, and you want to transfer it across the language barrier, and then you want to have an experience for the recipient that is specific in his culture, that is sort of specific to the way that he perceives the world and he interprets all the different kinds of things. It's not supposed to be just a word sequence. That is maybe not a one-to-one -one translation, but still a very close translation to uh, the original language, but you want to have a dissemination, you want to have the information that is being transported and the information should be packaged in a way that's specific to your language, your culture, your expectations, the way that you interact. And no, we haven't done it yet. We haven't really tried it yet, I guess because it's so difficult. We're, we're still struggling with this very symbolic sequence that we're trying to translate. And computers inherently are tailored to processing symbol sequences. They're not uh, uh, originally meant to process analog signals. So everything we do with processing analog signals and a variety of analog signals is actually more or less of a simulation of uh, analog analog signals in the computer and it's all done in symbolic sequences and I think that's the core why it, what it makes it, why it makes it so difficult to do it with machines what we want to do. But I agree we should do it. We should do dissemination not assimilation. We need some patience. It's a, it's a process that develops. We're still a very young science so hopefully we will get there and it's not that we don't want to get there. Jimena? quick response to that, there's always been a, um, um, a tension. If you think about the term natural language processing, we're doing really well on the processing part. But on the natural language part, we still have a ways to go. We have another question here. Thank you. Uh, this question is for Jean Senet. Uh, Senet. Huh? Okay, uh, for you, um, you were talking about empowering communities and giving them the capacity to engage in this. Um, it sounds a little bit idealistic. Practically, what would need to happen for them to be able to do that? And then um, the other question I have is for Mr. Hanke. Um, I was recently asked to evaluate avatars that are being used for sign language. I'm not deaf, I can't speak sign language. Um, what do you see as the key criteria? Because what you described, it seems that anybody could create an avatar um, and it would look as if they are signing efficiently. Uh, one of those avatars came from a Middle Eastern country with very few resources and the other came from an extremely rich uh, European country with huge amount of resources from a major company. They are not signing the same language because the sign languages in the two countries are quite different. How do you evaluate? Because as a government you may want to buy one of those solutions to help you to make government material available uh, to that community. So thank you for your question. So I think this is joining one of the, the points that was expressed in uh, Google presentation this morning. The responsibility of research scientists today is to simplify. We have a powerful tool and we need to simplify it at the maximum. And what I envision today is that at some point, someone from his home using internet will be able to continue training his AI system just by teaching few sentences. And as simple as that, it, he will be able to train a system that immediately will be available for everybody online. So what we need is to go to that level of simplification. And I think it's, it's a lot of uh, work to practical work to make that, but the science is there. We need to make that happening like that. It will be a, a, a website, you connect and you teach few sentences to your system, you correct it a bit like a kid, and then immediately it's available for everybody speaking the same language. It is where I think we want to go. How to evaluate um, avatars. 
Uh, the second uh, avatar that I showed was very low end and um, it looks very robotic and um, that's easy to, to evaluate that. Um, many people, many deaf people wouldn't understand what it signs. Um, so the, the most elementary uh, mm, test of course is do deaf people understand the avatar? Um, if you go, if you get beyond that um, hurdle, uh, the next is how much processing power does it need to understand that? So, what is ease of listening? Um, can you follow an avatar for half an hour and uh, are still happy with it? And um, I have to say, none of the avatar systems in the world are currently capable of uh, reaching that goal. Yeah, I would like to first make a comment and uh, ask a question actually to, to uh, all of you. Uh, comment I would like to make is uh, to, to thank very much uh, Sebastian because he provided um, automatic simultaneous translation uh, real time for this conference uh, with the kites uh, system. It's very, very courageous. I mean, we can see that the, the quality is, of course, not the quality of what can be uh, provided by uh, uh, human interprets and you can sleep quietly. I mean, we still need many, 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 many years, if ever, uh, to, uh, to achieve such a high quality. But thank you very much for your courage to provide this, uh, this machine translation. And I hope everyone will try it during this two-day uh, conference. Uh, the question I would like to raise, but it's a very general question. Uh, what is your uh, uh, opinion on the, uh, the state of uh, your, your uh, uh, speciality? Do you think the, the problem you are accessing is solved or close to be solved? Do you think it's the starting point from it, for it and there is still a huge amount of work to, 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 to do? Or do you think it's uh, somewhere in the middle and it's uh, already some achievement but still more uh, work to do? So what is the, uh, your ideas about this? About prosody, for example, about dialects, about uh, robots or, uh, or uh, sign language processing? Where are we now? Is it solved? Some people think that it's solved. Okay, they use it every day. They use uh, the vocal assistant, so it's okay, it's solved. But we see now that there are still open problems, isn't it? So where are we? So maybe I can share an example. Um, when we started to look at the media monitoring, uh, we found there is a problem in the standard language. Then we thought it's actually a case of dialect. We have to address dialect, which is one dialect. But what we realize is that when people become to speak, it's not the clear speak that like what I'm doing right now. We hesitate, we mumble, we are away from microphone, we drop the microphone on the floor. All of these cases, very rare to be represented in the research community when they report numbers, when we evaluate word error rate. And this is the reality. It, it, it was uh, very interesting to listen to one of the programs and we realized that when educated people switch a lot between Arabic and French and English. How do we handle this case? That's the reality. That's the speech in the wild. Although we claim now we have reached um, one digit word error rate in the standard uh, um, Arabic, for example, but where are we with, with this kind of speech? Because how many English dialect it is, because sometimes uh, somebody who's speaking American English or British English, so the dialect will go beyond the language itself. So this is how wild it is, and we're still very far from this. So regarding the prosody, and uh, just as I mentioned that uh, it is used to express the uh, speaker's intention and programmatic meanings. So it's very important when you want to know the real intention, the real, the real intention of the speaker, uh, especially for the uh, uh, dialogue system. Uh, so uh, from the scientific point of view, uh, I, I, I should say it's, uh, the research is just in the uh, midway has the we still need more corporations from the different uh, 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 parts uh, to do the interdisciplinary uh, work 
and especially uh, uh, from the uh, cognitive part, uh, to, to look at the real or the nature of the uh, prosody and uh, uh, what uh, the uh, function of it and uh, with the uh, uh, interaction uh, uh, with the uh, function and the form. So that's, I think, this in the middle part, I mean, the way. Uh, it's a far way to go. Thank you. Um, Khalid, uh, Joseph, what do you think? Should we be punctual or should we just know? Okay. Sorry? Okay. Let's, let's go for a punctual or for a last remark from your side. We, we do have poster presentations and we owe uh, some respect to the presenters. And I guess people need also some coffee to, uh, to wake up a little. Okay, I thank Second the presenters time. and also the audience. Thank you very much. Okay, so the, the next poster is the Latin America and the Caribbean language. So you can see the poster in the house thank you. Thank you. And please come back by uh, 
on.
Welcome back, everyone. <laughs> Hi, welcome back. I hope everyone's had some coffee. Um, so we're back to the next session on infrastructural aspects. And I'm Amanda Harris uh, from Paradisec and the University of Sydney. And I'm moderating this session along with Mark Lieberman from the University of Pennsylvania and Alexei Karpov from the um, St. Petersburg Institute for Inter Informatics and Automation of the Russian Academy of Sciences. So our first speaker um, is Denise DiPerzio, um, who's Associate Director of the Linguistic Data Consortium at the University of Pennsylvania, and she's going to be talking to us about developing and distributing language resources for all. Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure um, to be here and to talk to you today about the Linguistic Data Consortium in the context of the International Year of Indigenous Languages and LT for All. So um, I'll begin by briefly talking about LDC's founding and mission and how we share and curate language data. We'll then take a look at some language resources in um, languages that I think will be of interest to this group uh, and end uh, with research, colla or research collaborations in indigenous languages. LDC was founded with the mission to develop and distribute language resources to the broad global community. It's a collaboration of government, industry, and academia. And under the consortium model, each of those parties makes a contribution to the consortium and in return for its contribution receives a benefit. So researchers contribute data sets that are published in our uh, online catalog. And in return for that, they receive visibility and recognition for their work work, in addition to inspiring new research or building on um, previous research. Our members and non-member data licensees pay fees, uh, and in return for that, receive ongoing rights to a, a large number of language resources. And finally, uh, sponsors contribute funding for resource creation, infrastructure, innovation, and so on. Uh, and uh, the big benefit, uh, actually, to everyone is that resources created in funded projects are almost always then distributed to the broad community through our catalog. Our catalog debuted in 1993. So as of today, we have distributed close to 200,000 copies of more than 800 data sets, as you see here, to roughly 6,000 distinct organizations in 100 countries. And we add new data sets monthly to the catalog. Um, our data sets are distributed under, under a variety of license agreements, but the basic distribution model is that our data is used for language research, education, and technology development. We've had an ongoing project to take a look at papers that cite LDC data. This study is by no means complete, but as of now, we've identified at least 10,000 unique papers that talk about LDC data. And I think this demonstrates the research impact of um, widespread sharing of language resources. So LDC's primary mission at its founding was to be a permanent language resource archive. Um, we've recently been certified as a core trust seal trustworthy repository. That's a certification that's given by the World Data System and the Data Seal of Approval. These are two Dutch organizations, and this is an international standard, which means that the catalog meets um, high standards for data access, metadata, licensing, distribution, storage, et cetera. We have a documented curation workflow. So that means that all data that's um, distributed through the catalog undergo reviews, quality checks, metadata creation, uh, and documentation. Our data is stored in a state-of-the-art backup system with the ability to migrate that data to new formats and standards as needed or as um, suggested by best practices for digital repositories. And our licenses are consistent with community uses um, and also address concerns um, that both data providers and users have that can include human subjects collections, privacy, intellectual property, as well as tr uh, tribal rights to um, community languages. So in the course of fulfilling its mission, LDC has developed the expertise in infrastructure to um, provide um, accessible 
access to um, data to all users with appropriate protections. Um, it's, it's been clear for the last decade or so that researchers and funders have been interested in developing resources for many more languages, and those languages are referred to variously as indigenous languages, minority languages, endangered languages, um, et cetera. But whatever you call them, I think, I think the, the common denominator is that these are underserved language communities. And as we've heard today, human language technologies need digital resources. And and in some cases, for, li for certain languages, there is just scarce source data. Uh, and, uh, and, in, and in other languages, or even for the same languages, it can be that the language structure itself presents particular resource, uh, research challenges. So um, looking at some LDC uh, case studies, um, we can see how some of these challenges were addressed. Um, we have done some work in West African languages. We distribute uh, data sets of um, Nagamba and uh, Deshang tone paradigms. And we know that West African languages have certain challenges in the sense that they have complex phonology and morphology uh, and also may not have established writing systems. So in the case of the Bantu data sets, um, uh, that data is annotated uh, for tone and morphology. We have developed three lexicons in Mande languages uh, and a Yoruba lexicon. Our Yoruba lexicon includes not only information about how the language is spoken in West Africa, but also follows the language diaspora. So it includes information on the variants that developed in the Caribbean um, and southeastern United States. Uh, in the Mande languages, one of those lexicons for Mwakakan, um, the a international phonetic alphabet was used as the transliteration system there, um, given the lack of a writing system. In the other two, Manikakan and Bamanakan, um, Latin script was used, but those uh, lexicons also have English, French, bidirectional glosses to reflect the Francophone context of those languages. Um, LDC also contri has contributed to field work, particularly uh, recently in Papua New Guinea and Brazil, and those were collections in which smart technologies were used to collect data. The community used smartphones and other handheld devices to record their speech, which was then collaboratively transcribed by the community. We also um, distribute a data set called Malto Speech and Transcripts. Malto is a language that's spoken in northeastern India and Bangladesh by people called the Parahi. Uh, and that uh, data set includes stories about um, village life, life stories, uh, and folklore. Finally, we've also developed language packs, and those are data sets of core resources and tools for languages that lack either sources or tools or both. So here's an image from um, the Bamanacan or Bambara lexicon, uh, and you can see, and the interface that you're looking at here is the Linguist Toolbox, which is uh, software that's available from SIL. So this is what an entry looks like. You see the word. And you see that this particular word is both an interjection and a pronoun. So the description of that is given both in English and French. Uh, and then for each of um, uh, each of the particular uses, there are example sentences in Bambara, English, and French. This is an image of collaborative um, transcription in Papua New Guinea. So in this case, the speech data that would have been collected using smart devices has been uploaded into, the, into a laptop or laptops. And already on the laptop will be a transcription software program. Uh, and so then digital transcripts are now being created um, shortly after the speech data is collected. Um, LDC was funded in two U.S. projects to collect language packs. And language packs have certain um, standard elements. There's usually uh, a monolingual corpus, a uh, parallel text corpus, and that data can be annotated in various ways depending on the research task. Annotations can include translation, named entity tagging, uh, annotations for events and situations. 
Um, there's also basic tools uh, included, and the idea there is that um, these are basic tools that someone can use in connection with the data to sort of ramp up and get some basic technologies running. The packs also include lexicons and grammatical sketches. So they can be used for multiple purposes, language documentation and preservation, uh, is one, basic technology development as well, and I think those two work together hand in hand. Um, in the Lorelei project, which is referenced here, the research um, problem was situational awareness. So the idea was to develop uh, resources and tools and selected languages that would be able to be deployed quickly in cases of a natural disaster or a humanitarian disaster to develop technologies that would facilitate communications between people affected by the disaster and people who were trying to assist those who were affected. So we're expecting at least 20 or so of these language packs um, to enter our catalog beginning next year because these, the, the projects have been com are finishing up. And I've listed some of the languages that are going to be represented in those packs. Um, our research collaborations uh, are indications of how we interact with our, our global community and research collaborators, sister networks, et cetera, um, in projects that talk about standards for data access and how repositories can make indigenous language materials um, more available. We also um, have a special interest in languages of the Americas where we have provided some technical assistance with collections and with recent funding from the University of Pennsylvania. We convened two workshops in 2018, one in Philadelphia and one in Mexico City, where we talked first about data centers and how, uh, again, we can collaborate better on sharing and getting more resources in languages of the Americas and in Mexico City where research issues were more specifically discussed. This is a snapshot of our global network which just shows you uh, people were in contact for various things, whether it's data contributors, um, where we conduct collections, where we have other kinds of collaborators. Um, and so before, uh, I think right here, I would just want to interject quickly on the 7,000 language issue that we've been discussing the last few days. Um, I'm happy to say LDC has, has recently launched a portal called Language Arc. It's a citizen linguist portal, the idea being that people can uh, contribute information about their language by conducting various tasks and activities or creating their own tasks and activities. And we have a poster on that in tomorrow morning's poster session, so I hope you'll stop by and learn more about that. So wrapping up, access is a crucial theme um, of this international year, and access to education, information, and knowledge in, in your own language. And I think that's in harmony with LDC's um, founding principle that broad access to data drives knowledge and information, and we remain committed to serving all language communities with language resources. Thank you. So our next speaker is Yohei Murakami, who's Associate Professor at Rizumaken University in Japan, and who will be talking about language sphere and um, approach to bilingual dictionary creation. Okay, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the uh, current research project named Language Sphere. The Language Sphere is a social technical system to create bilingual dictionaries for indigenous languages. So first of all, uh, let me introduce our history. So as you know, uh, we have more than 7,000 languages. So based on the statistics of the ethnologue, currently 7,111 languages are spoken today. So we have uh, many, many language barriers all over the world. So to overcome the barriers, we developed the multilingual service platforms named the Language Grid and have operated it since 2007. Our approach is not to create the language resources, but to connect the existing language resources to create multilingual environment for users. 
So by combining the several machine translators, we can cover the more languages. Moreover, by combining it with domain-specific resources, we can customize marginal services for users, users' fields, such as the education field and the medical field, and so on. So to this end, we introduce the concept of the services into the language resources. The services is an interaction between a user and a provider to solve the user's problems. So by shifting the perspective from language resources to the language services, binary dictionary data becomes word translation service. And parallel text data becomes a lookup similar translation service. Also, machine translator becomes a high speed translation service. Even human interpreter becomes a high quality translation service. Moreover, by combining the, those language services, we can create composite language services with added values. After more than 10 years operations, now 183 groups from 24 countries have joined the language grid. And 226 language services are shared on the language grid. But still we have the limitation of the number of the supported languages because the number depends on the registered language resources. So we started to create language resources, especially bilingual dictionary among low resource languages to cover more languages on the language grid. So this is a language sphere project. So this project firstly targeted, targeted on the languages in Indonesia because there are many ethnic groups in Indonesia and their languages are so similar and belong to the same language families. So this is a dendrogram of 119 languages in Indonesia generated by hierarchical clustering based on the language similarity. So we identified 11 clusters whose similarity is more than 50%. So our question is, how might we create bilingual dictionaries among those dense clusters comprehensively? So first key idea is people-based bilingual dictionary creations. So given two dictionaries sharing one common language, we can combine them via people to language and extract reachable translation pairs between both ends. So in this way, in this case, Indonesian is a people to language, and we can create a bilingual dictionary between Malay and Minangkabau. So these are two dictionaries. But of course, the simple reachable pairs may include mistranslations. Therefore, we employ the several constraints to filter mistranslations. So in this way, we can create a bilingual dictionary between a certain language pairs from two dictionaries, like this. And to comprehensively create a bilingual dictionary, we extend this method to the language set. So firstly, we create a hub type network of existing dictionary among intra-cluster languages. And based on the network, we can create more dictionary within a cluster. Moreover, we create a graph network among inter-cluster languages to cover all of the language pairs comprehensively. But still, we have uh, two questions. 
first question is, can we have uh, enough existing dictionaries to form a network? So we need uh, at least two dictionaries. So we, need to, we have to involve the human to creation process. The second question is, which language pair has biggest impact on the other dictionary creations? So in this approach, an output dictionary is used to create a new dictionaries. So it means the dictionary creation depends on other dictionary creations. So output dictionary become an input dictionary in the next term. So we have to carefully choose the order of the dictionary creations. So we apply a social technical approach to a dictionary creation process. This process consists of two loops, human-human loop and human-machine loops. The former loop creates a C's dictionary and complements a human-machine loops. And the latter creates a new dictionary from the two C's dictionaries. So this process enables human-machine collaborations. And to minimize the total cost, we carefully make a decision on which language pair to manu manually create and on which language pair to apply the people-to-based applications. So to solve this problem, we employ a Markov decision process. And to validate this process, we conducted the uh, Indonesian language sphere experiment last year. So we collected 34 Indonesian native speakers. Eight of them can speak Malay, five of them, Minangkabau, nine Jab Japanese, and 12 Sundanese. And it took 36 days to create 10 dictionaries. And uh, as a result, we can reduce the cost by 40% compared to the manual creation for every dictionary. So this is the last slide for the dis uh, potential discussion topics learned from the previous experiment. So this is uh, sustainability of language resource creations. So first one is monetization of language resources in low resource languages. So the previous experiment conducted by using the research budget, but uh, after finishing this research, who can pay it? And also, what kind of actions are charged for? And also, uh, second question is the incentive design for workers. So this experiment, we hired the workers, but uh, usually for sustain the, this process, we need the several incentive designs. So that's all, thank you very much. So next we'll be hearing from Craig Cornelius, who is Senior Software Engineer, International Engineering Google from the US, who's talking about Unicode. The good news is that almost every written language already can be used on the internet, on almost every device in the world. Next slide, please. Oh. I'm sorry, I should know technology. So I'd like to give you a few examples of success that's been had with basic language technology for um, supporting languages. And I'm including three groups, the Cherokee in North America, Pular, Fofoldi in Africa, and both of those groups are presenting posters tomorrow, and uh, they will be live here. The third example is Chakma. Our Chakma friend could not attend, but he sent a video, which I'm hoping we'll be able to play. Uh, can you help me play that? Or do I play it myself? You might need to switch screens. Juju Bekonore, I am Bibuti Chakma. I would like to talk to you about I should know how to do this better. Yeah. 
let me tell you a little bit about Bhavuti. Bhavuti is a man who has been working on his language. He has, like the others, all worked in getting his writing system into the Unicode standard. He has worked with Google and other companies to develop computer keyboards and fonts, and he's going to tell about it himself. My language, Chakma, and how to advance to become digital, revive from being endangered, connected with social media, messaging platform, and YouTube. Since I was born, I have found that my language has been very neglected. It is huge only in its piece. If the language is lost, then we will disappear one day. This language needs to be protected. To protect my language, I made it digital, starting with creating a phone. The phone name is Riving Uni. Now works well in modern technology on computer, internet, and smartphone. Then I had to create a Chakma keyboard layout. It was upgraded with the help of the Kim and team. This keyboard name is EG Chakma keyboard and it supports iPhone and iPad, Linux, MacOS, Android, Windows, mobile webs. webs. In May uh, 2018, Facebook added our Chakma language. Google Zboot apps added my keyboard layout on Android in September 2019. We added a virtual keyboard, Chakma Converter, and some resources for Chakma language. I have published my activities in a book. Now it is time to change our attitude and understand that technology is helping us sustain indigenous language. First, the people of the indigenous communities must come forward voluntarily to open their language to technology as I'm currently doing. I strongly urge all indigenous people to digitalize their language so young people can learn it too. Thanks to everyone. Great, thank you. So what I'd like to do is tell you basic stuff that many of you know already, but it's important to understand that there is basic bits and bytes stuff down underneath. For any, in any computer system, in, in any computer system, any text is important to understand that it's in digital form, in codes. That is put through a software system which is called Renderer, which uses fonts to display image data. Uh, image data, uh, and those images are individual characters in most cases. And that's always using a font. The font is simply a table of codes that are indexed into a set of shapes. So the three essentials for getting a language online, and text underlies all the technologies we've been talking about today, are a standard for encoding the characters, fonts that actually define the shapes of the characters that are displayed, and ways that people can actually enter these characters in the first place, and there are many different ways of doing that. Uh, and encoding is the term we use that just says it's an agreement that certain codes mean certain characters. So for example, the codes given there, U plus 41, U plus 1000, U plus 1817, are all codes representing the abstract concept of characters. But it is important to note that these do not specify the exact shape of the character and that many fonts can be implemented to show exactly the form of the character that one wants. Unicode is a way of making this happen um, that is universally uh, useful. It provides a unique character for each, or a unique, unique code for each character of all the different writing systems in the world that have been encoded so far. And each code not only includes the name of the abstract character and a representative shape, but also has character properties that can be used for further information processing, such as upper and lower casing, or determining where where things break between words, between sentences, between lines. The Unicode standard was developed by several people sitting together, probably over a beer, back in California in, 19, in the early 1990s. And the first release was done by the Unicode Consortium with only 24 different writing systems. They added the CJK, Chinese, Japanese, and Korean ideographs, shortly, and the latest release last summer now has 150 scripts, and yes, that does include emojis, and there are now 137,000 characters, and new versions are released annually. Unicode is important, why? 
Well, because it's a default on almost every computer system in the world these days. It took a while, but it's also important to note that it's stable. It doesn't change. And because each character in each of the languages has a unique code, multilingual documents can be created without having to shift between fonts, between coding systems. There is also a standardization process in place that anyone can propose new characters or new writing systems, and membership in the Unicorn Consortium is open to individuals, organizations, companies, and it's open source and freely available without any license or charge. There is also a set of software called International Components for Unicode, which is a set of libraries that support text processing and all the various things computers do for you. If you ever wonder why your web page knows where to break and go to the next line, and when you change the width of the page, it automatically changes the line spacing properly. That is one of the functions of the ICU library that's built into every cell phone in the world. ICU also in English means, or in American English, means uh, the intensive care unit. And if you don't use the ICU library, you will wish you were in the ICU. It's publicly, publicly available for free use and has many contributors. Unicode in practice has risen in importance on the internet. It's not the enco only encoding system out there, but as you can see with the blue line on the graph, the implementation of Unicode has become the majority of the web content out there, and it's the default on almost every new device these days. Most living writing systems are already in Unicode, and many writing systems that are no longer used actively are there for scholarly use. Indigenous languages, you may use Unicode now. Almost every language is, is uh, able to represent its characters in this, but it requires humans to recruit community champions to help people learn how to use this. And then choosing a writing system, we encourage people to use writing systems that are already in there or work in a standardization process. There are Unicode fonts that are published by Google and many other sources, and people build their own Unicode fonts as shown by Bavuti's video there. And Input methods can be built by, your, by yourself, and many companies build them, as my friend Dan told this morning about Gboard. And then, the most important thing is once these keyboards, fonts, and Unicode implementations are available, people can use this to create text and documents and other things that people can then use more advanced tools, such as search and other things, to find their content online. Thank you in many languages. So the next presentation uh, is from Carl Rubino, who's Research Pro Program Manager at IARPA, the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Activity in the US. Yes, we actually call it IARPA, which is the research wing of the ODNI, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. I'm Carl Rubino, a program manager that specializes in human language technology programs. So IARPA, um, is, a, is responsible for creating research programs that we think will address challenging problems, often very risky, that would be of benefit to the intelligence community and the American people. And this research is often affected by multi, world-class multinational scientific teams, often with multidisciplinary approaches. So let me introduce you first to the Babel program. The Babel program was initiated in 2011 as a, it was a brainchild of Mary Harper. And as you see, this program is um, to help with the problem of audio keyword search in low resource languages. And wh when I mean low resource languages, you look at the list of the four periods of the program, you'll see languages like Luo, Igbo, Guarani, Tokpisan. These are languages that have very minimal web presence and very difficult to solve ASR or automatic speech recognition problems in the amount of training data that we gave to the, to the teams to solve the problems. So let me, um, for period one, for instance, for every period of the program, we have two, two different periods, um, two cycles. We have a development cycle with practice languages. In period one, they had worked with four languages. And then we evaluate the team's progress using and then for we made the more difficult. So in period one, we to build an audio recognition system in Vietnamese in a month. 
By the period four, they had to work with the Georgian language in only one week. The languages were chosen because of the typological diversity, phonetic inventory. We wanted to ensure that the teams can create engines or systems that could possibly be portable to other languages without the use of linguistic expertise. We forbade the um, linguistic knowledge to solve the problem because we wanted to, to promote machine learning approaches. Now some of you might laugh if you look at the training conditions because with only 80 hours of training, what are you going to do with machine learning? And a lot of the, for this particular problem, because we were concentrating on, the, on a metric for for um, information retrieval or a keyword search, um, you might be able to solve the problem with a 50% word error rate. And that was a very important aspect of the problem of the program is that we were not measuring word error rate. We were for correlational analysis, but we wanted to see if these people could build systems that can handle keyword search, audio keyword search. No translation was involved. Then I started the material program, which kicked it up a notch, uh, introducing a bunch of uh, new, uh, new technologies, um, language identification, cross-language information retrieval, cross-lingual, and even cross-lingual summarization. So the performers on this program had to build systems that can take an English query, queried, a base, queried against a multilingual database of speech and text, and find relevant documents, and when I say documents, these are, could be from speech or text, and prove that they're relevant with some sort of a summary, maybe a query by a summary or some sort of evidence in English. So English in, English out system. And to make the, the problem more challenging, we made sure that the evaluation condition did not match the training condition. And this in, resulted in forcing the performers to learn how to harvest the data so they can um, resolve this, the, the mismatch in the training condition. For instance, in speech, they were given telephony data. Um, the telephony data was recorded in country, 30 different countries, um, 2,000 speakers, the transcribed in a conventionalized orthography. This was, these were not crowdsourced transcriptions. But they were evaluated with broadcast media and topical audio. So we want to ensure that the system would be portable. And this was a, a proxy for, to, to affect that. For text, they were given only 800,000 words of parallel text in Newswire, in the genre of Newswire. But they were evaluated in different conditions in social media, much, much more informal. Okay. Another thing about the material is that we, were, we are interested in the progress of the component technologies, for instance, the machine translation or speech recognition, but that was not the metric of the program. We wanted a functional and unified metric that would measure an end-to-end -end condition. And in this program, there were two end-to-end -end conditions. There was the clear condition where we, we measured the system's ability to return documents. And this was a metric that was automated because we, the ground truth was fully, fully annotated for relevance. But we also wanted to measure the system's ability to create English summaries with a human in the loop. And this is not an automated evaluation. This we crowdsourced from English Amazon Mechanical Turkers. The metric itself is called AQWV, actual query weighted value. It's a one minus error rate. So a perfect score would be one, and systems would be penalized for returning false alarms or misses. Um, you, this, this metric also showed up in the recent Open Clear contest. Which language information retrieval. Okay, one thing I'd like to point out is before we designed the program, before writing the BA, I wanted to understand
used Kali underneath them uh, to do these things. So that's partly why it has been very successful. Of course, technologically it uses deep neural nets and so on. But again, if we wanted to do language technology for all, we have to think about creating tools like this. At this point, Kaldi is used by academics and people who know speech technology. There needs to be a second layer, a second generation of people who then can convert that into more directly usable products for people. So that's the role of Kaldi. And uh, one of the things we do with Kaldi is, uh, is that we actually build recipes to do specific things. So if you want to build a Tagalog speech recognizer and you happen to have 100 hours of speech, what Jan has done is he has looked at many use cases like that and figured out how to do it right and laid it out. So it's like having like, you know, a recipe and tools and so on. So if you think of a kitchen analogy, your data are the ingredients that go into the cooking and Kaldi are the, the food processor and the oven and the other things and Yenda then provides you the recipes which say combine them in this way. So that has been the success of these tools. There are others, there is something called Moses where the people have put out a speech translation tool based on neural nets recently called Sokai which has done in collaboration with Amazon and so on. Uh, the other thing that we do are these workshops. So I've put that JSALT, it's actually a long name, it's the Frederick Jelinek Memorial Workshops on Speech and Language Technology, J for Jelinek, so JSALT. Uh, so what these are, are trying to solve problems in a collaborative way. So we do it every summer, we've been doing it since 1995 at Johns Hopkins. We, maybe there are three teams or four teams, each team focuses on a particular problem. So one problem might be, oh, speech technology works well when you have a close talking microphone and the room is quiet, but what happens when there's a lot of other stuff going on or the microphone is far away in the room or something like that? So you might say, okay, let's get a database like that and let's get some of the best people in the world to work on it and let's bring them together. So this is like the dream team thinking. And typically our teams have about 10, 15 people, maybe half of them are senior people. And one of the things we've realized being academics is that the real engine of innovation are young people. So we bring in PhD students and the graduates and we work together for two months. And many breakthroughs in speech and language technologies have come through these joint activities. And when I say people from all over the world, I'm remembering these statistics from one of the workshops. A few years ago we had one in Seattle. There were 50 participants participants in the workshop and the 50 participants came from 27 different institutions from nine different countries and four different continents. So basically these are truly uh, community efforts. We try to bring people together and like, we really think like the dream team, like you know, what's the best set of people to solve a particular problem. So if we wanted to do language technology for all, we want to think about doing more of these things where we bring in people who work on a particular set of languages to sit down, focus together and make progress. And last but not the least, oh, by the way, these workshops are not like conferences. When, when I say workshop to my academic colleagues, it's like, oh, do I present papers? No, you do this. You sit in front of computers and you work for two months. So that's what we do in our workshops. But I should mention one more thing that we've been doing uh, for the last few years. SLTU stands for the, spoke, the, the speech, speech and Language Technologies for Under-Resourced Languages. This was mentioned again in the earlier session this morning. It's uh, a workshop jo run jointly by International Speech Communication Association, or ISCA, and uh, ELRA, no, is it ELRA? I, I can't, anyway. Anyway, so it's run every, two, every other year, started in 2008, and this session of this is a conference, it focuses on language technology for under-resourced languages and some of the people who run it including Laurent Bessachir is sitting back there. And I started getting associated with this in 2016 where we said, okay, one of the things we need to do to build language technologies in all languages is to develop human capital in the language of interest. People who speak, know, work with that language need to know how to build these tools. So we started doing one day tutorials, saying the tools are out there, but let's show you how to use them well so that you can realize its full potential. And uh, it was very successful, so we've been doing it repeatedly since then. Uh, of course, it was not just us, our colleagues from Google helped, so there was a speech synthesis tutorial run by Martin Janshe and uh, Richard Sprout. And then uh, last year or two years ago, we added machine translation, and my colleague Kevin Du uh, ran a full day tutorial on that. And so the idea is that this is how we can build a community of people interested in many, many languages who all know how to use these tools best. And so, for example, in 2016, 
Yenda developed a recipe for Iban. This language, in case you don't know, is spoken in parts of Malaysia and Indonesia. Total population of speakers, less than a million. And then when we were in Delhi in 2018, we built one for Bengali. Again, Bengali has more than 200 million speakers, last I checked, maybe 250. But it's still under-resourced. Uh, like, you know, Bangladesh, India, neither of them seems to be putting a lot of money into it. So there aren't many resources. So these are the kind of things we've been doing. And uh, I feel we should do more of these in the future to build a community of both tools and of people who know the tools and the tools themselves to make progress. Thank you. So the final speaker in this afternoon's session is Georg Rehm, the Principal Researcher and Research Fellow at the DFKI, the Deutsches Forschungszentrum für Künstliche Intelligenz. In Germany. <lacht> Vielen herzlichen Dank für die Einführung ähm, und die Einladung, hier heute unser Projekt vorstellen zu dürfen. Good late afternoon, everyone, and thanks very much to the organizers for the invitation, Josef, Khalid, and all the others. So, the European Language Grid. Um, I would like to give you in the next 10 minutes a very, very brief overview and also a brief demo of the project and the platform. Right, so you know that Europe, and I'm focusing in this talk on Europe specifically as a multilingual region. Europe is a multilingual society. Multilingualism is at the heart of the European project and the European idea. We have 24 official member state languages in the European Union and they all have the same status. In addition, we have regional languages, minority languages, as well as languages of immigrants and important trade partners and this intra-European multilingual setup creates many economic, social, technological challenges. Um, for example, the digital single market won't be a single market at all if it's not multilingual. Instead, it will be fragmented because of language borders. Furthermore, as you all know, we've had the dream of technology-enabled and technology-supported multilingualism, cross-border, cross-lingual, cross-cultural communication for many years now. Furthermore, to, come, to make it even worse, the European language technology landscape is pretty fragmented. Metanet is a network of excellence, a European network of excellence that we founded in 2010. It consists of 60 research centers in 34 European countries, and the goal of Metanet, which is the origin um, evolutionary of this project, is the technological foundations of a multilingual Europe. That's the goal. Um, and just, just to give you a couple of impressions in a, in a compressed timeline here, as Metanet we've been working on this topic for about 10 years now. Several EU projects paved the ground and prepared the ground for the European language grid, which you can see on the right hand side here. With this new project we can now finally implement a platform for the European LT community to collect all European LT services and data sets. And we first voiced this idea and the need for such a platform uh, in 2013. So, but before I start with the European language grid, Joseph asked me to mention this again. It's a bit, it's a bit dusty, uh, but still I will, uh, I will do as I'm told. Um, so, back in 2010, 2011, we produced the MetaNet language white papers, which you can see here on the and the photo called Europe's Languages in the European, uh, in the Digital Age. And we did this together with more than 200 colleagues uh, from all over Europe and, and many of you participated in this. Um, I think about 20, 25 of you participated in this exercise. Um, we put together this tabular overview here uh, of the technology support of Europe's languages. And that looks rather dire, yeah, so there's no excellent support for any language and then a long tail of languages where there's no support at all or weak support. Uh, we summarized this result in the insight that at least 21 European languages are in severe danger of digital language extinction. Why? Because their support through technologies is severely lacking. Um, so yeah, we carried out the study in 2011, 2012 more or less and while support for many of these languages uh, and also overall has improved in the meantime thanks to various breakthroughs in neural technologies and language modeling and so on. Um, the bigger picture appears to remain mostly the same. 
So the MetaNet white papers made a lot of impact when we published them in 2012. We had many colleagues with television interviews, radio interviews. We had many pieces in not only in scientific articles, uh, in scientific publications, but also in, in the regular press and many newspapers all over Europe. Um, so they raised the visibility of the topic in Europe, in the European Union, and also in the European Commission. They helped make available new funding for language technology related topics in various national and also international funding agencies. And I'm especially happy about the fact that based on the European language white papers, our colleagues in India decided to prepare 22 white papers for 22 scheduled languages in India. So in now going to the next slide, there it is. So in early 2017, uh, there was a very influential workshop in the European Parliament and organized by the Scientific uh, Foresight Unit um, in the Parliament on language technology and the meaning of language technology for Europe, for the European project. Um, and this workshop was the final preparatory step for a very long, comprehensive, exhaustive report that was produced, uh, also by our colleagues in Spain. Um, and this report produced 11 recommendations to the European institutions. One of these recommendations was to establish a European language technology platform that provides data sets and services. And another one was to bridge the, to bridge the technology gap between European languages. Um, based on the STOA report um, and other pieces of input, the European Parliament uh, prepared this report here. Um, the resolution language equality in the digital age, uh, which was spearheaded by Jill Evans, a member of the European Parliament from Wales in the UK. It includes 45 recommendations on various related topics, including the creation of U European LT platform for sharing of services. So we first suggested the idea um, and the need to build a larger European language technology platform back in 2013 when we published the MetaNet SRA for Multilingual Europe 2020. Um, and you can see the platform in, the, this, this, in this idea here in the upper right corner. So this is almost 10 years old already, um, laying the foundation of the European language grid. Now, uh, in the remaining four minutes, I will briefly mention um, the project. So with this European language grid, or ELG for short project, we now have the opportunity to actually develop and populate this platform. Um, this is the project consortium here. Brief remark on the name because the Japanese language grid was mentioned before. Um, the project is called European Language Grid uh, because the original call for project proposals from the European Commission was called European Language Grid. We like the title, we use the title. So this is the simple story behind this. So the main objectives of the European Language Grid, we want to establish the ELG as the primary platform and marketplace for language technology in Europe as a platform for commercial and non-commercial language technologies, both functional and non-functional, so not only data sets, in air quotes. Uh, we want to enable the whole community to upload services and data sets into the platform and aim to unleash the potential for innovation and enable businesses to grow. Technically, um, this is a, a, a very rough um, architecture diagram here. Technically, the platform is built on the notion of virtualization and containerization. Um, all the main technical components are individual images, uh, Docker images in the system, just like the services. And I will give you some examples next up. So let me now uh, briefly show you the state of play as of about two months ago. Right now the technical team is actually in Athens, in Greece, uh, in one of our coding weeks, and they are developing the platform further. So, um, so this is a little uh, video that we produced. It's a draft version, but almost ready. This is the first functional prototype of the system. Um, the first minimum viable product. It's meant to be the system, the one-stop shop platform for European language technologies. It's basically structured in language technologies and resources and data sets and into the community. Um, and one of our slogans is language technologies for Europe, uh, made in Europe. Here you can uh, use a very simple search facility to browse the European language grid on the left hand side, you can see the languages. We structure them right now in this prototype into three groups. The official EU languages, then other European languages, and then 
Furthermore, other languages, you can search for various keywords for metadata. Um, this is one example resource that you can find in the catalog and then download. Um, next up, we can also search for services, for example, so going beyond data sets, we can search for named entity recognition tools. Um, here we can pick the any named entity recognizer, which is built on the gate toolkit and software that is built at the University of Sheffield. Um, and this is now the next step, we perceive it. Uh, so you can actually use these services in the platform. And the web interface is one thing. Uh, the most crucial thing is that you can also use the public APIs of the platform. So the idea is that we want to enable pilot projects to use these publicly available APIs to make use of these eventually hundreds and hundreds of services and also thousands of data sets that will be available in the platform. So there are a couple of other um, demos coming up here, concept identification from one of our SME partners. Uh, we have machine translation built in ASR. Um, Caldi-based software is also integrated, of course, um, machine translation and, and many other services. Right now we have about 100 services in there. Um, and the, this is even a prototype, so it's not even a full production version. The first release will come in March, April next year. So I already mentioned the pilot projects. Um, the idea is that we are organizing two open pilot projects. Maybe this is interesting for some of you. Um, we expect pro approximately 15 to 20 pilot projects to be funded. Proposals can ask for up to 200,000 euros for innovative project proposals that either extend the platform or that make use of the platform and validate the platform. Um, so finally, uh, this is almost my, my last slide already, um, we see the future role of the platform in various um, different European project calls and funding programs like Digital Europe program um, and also Horizon Europe. Um, but one role that is missing on this slide here uh, is obviously that we also envision the ELG approach, let's call it the ELG approach, uh, could also be a technical template for other multilingual regions as a blueprint for other uh, multilingual societies and regions to build up their own X language grid in, in other uh, regions. So to sum up, we want to establish the ELG as the primary platform for industry relevant language technology in Europe. The ELG is supposed to become the marketplace for the European LT business space to strengthen Europe's position in the field. And this is an initiative from the European LT community for the European LT community. So if you want to know more, um, please feel free to join us at LREC 2020 in May in Marseille, where we will have a, a, a workshop on, uh, on language platforms, the first international workshop on language technology platforms, where we hope we can assemble the whole community who work on similar related um, activities, platforms, grid, framework, excuse me, frameworks, and so on. Uh, and we will also have a tutorial on the ELG. Thank you very much for your attention. So we have about 15 minutes for questions and discussion. Uh, so just a comment for Georg. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you thought the white papers, the MetaNet white papers, were maybe a dusty resource. Um, and I would I'd like to suggest, on the contrary, that we all continue to cite them until their findings become no longer true. So just as a, I didn't mention this, but what we are trying to do, because this was a very, very intense time back then when we compiled this, um, and it was also cumbersome to compile all the data that we, that we used to put these uh, these comparisons together and one of the, the things that we try to do with the European language grid is to, br to produce these tabular overviews dynamically on the fly. So, so the ambition and goal is to have all the data sets, services and so on available for the main European languages in the system. If we have them in the system, we can do it on the fly. So this is the idea that we have 
in, in, the, in the future. So maybe in two or three years this will be available. I have a question for uh, Craig. Um, hey, here at the back. Um, the question is, how, do, how does one get uh, Unicode um, to be interested? I mean, how do you create a script, for instance? Um, my language is Yoruba, which is spoken in Nigeria, um, but it still struggles on, um, with computers to be, to be used to write because some of the characters, Yoruba uses diacritics on top and under uh, letters, vowels. Um, some of them still haven't been created in, or, or haven't been accounted for in Unicode. So how does one do that? Do, do we petition? How, what's the process of getting something like that uh, fixed? Thank you. Uh, I think your question is, how do I get additional characters in, into the standard so that they can be used in your language? Yes. Um, the first thing is to make sure that they aren't already there. There are, there are many uni Unicode characters that people don't know about. So I could help you with that. Um, there is a process online. Unicode.org has its process quite well outlined. And basically, it's a matter of generating a proposal for the characters, giving evidence that the characters are actually used, because we don't want to add characters that are just being uh, developed uh, new. And with that evidence, that is reviewed by a committee. People are encouraged to give evidence. And um, when the characters have good attribution, then uh, they will be added to the Unicode standard. If I could just add something to that as someone who's been, was involved for many years in trying to represent Yoruba in Unicode as a result of the Yoruba dictionary that at LDC we produced, the problem has been that you can represent all of the Yoruba characters with combinations of base characters and things that go on top and things that go below. The reason in, um, 15 years ago that was very problematic because browsers and text editors and so forth were extremely bad at combining pieces of characters in a p proper way and so something that would look right in one browser would be completely wrong in another one. And there's another problem with that um, method, which is that because there are different orders in which you can combine things, getting a consistent representation for search and processing purposes was, was a bit of a problem. So there were um, efforts made, because there are precomposed characters for some major European languages, there was a proposal, there were um, separate specific proposals made to the Unicode Consortium, all of which were rejected on the grounds that, the, that you could make composed characters. The situation is a little better now in that essentially all um, browsers and text editors and so forth uh, compose characters properly and also there are standards for producing a standard version of decompose everything and then compose everything in a standard order. It's still a pain in the rear end compared to what it would be if there were pre-composed characters. But I think, unfortunately, the result is that you can complain all you want and Unicode will say no. Let's talk later. <laughs>
I can't say which font will represent this. We problem. do that all the time. They, but there are four fonts that are wrong, and wherever, whenever the user browser or the cell phone or a, um, a, say a computer script does something like automated headers or whatever, uh, where we cannot control the font. Of course, we're controlling the font the more we, as much as we can. But whenever we cannot, and the default takes over, the default is a wrong one. What do we do in that case? Uh, I, I don't have a specific answer for you, but I'd like to take that offline and, and uh, talk about that more. I think we have some uh, Craig, let me speak because I don't want you to defend something that you shouldn't be defending. So what you should clarify is that the Unicode Consortium and Unicode itself addresses an interchange format. It says this is the convention in which we should speak and listen and read and write. Right? But the actual rendering of the fonts, the actual input method is different on every device, different on every operating system. And it's, for example, if it's not working in Microsoft Word, it's Microsoft problem, not the Unicode consortium. So unfortunately, like, you know, this is a clean way to do it because things are specific to devices and so on and so forth. So Unicode consortium on principle doesn't get into it. Even Mark's thing about combined characters, they say, no, this is the clean way to do it. And so I actually agree with the way the Unicode consortium works. The problem is outside. I'm not here to blame the Unicode Consortium. I'm here to ask where do we go for problems like that? Craig might have an answer to that one. I, I, I think that's too much for this Q&A question, but I'd be happy to talk with you about possible solutions offline on that. Hi, my name is Dr. Isabel Zog. I'm from Columbia University. and. Um, for in regards to the last two questions, but particularly the the most recent one, um, and also just general information uh, for the audience, if you have anything, um, if you have a script or characters that are not in Unicode, you should contact the Script Encoding Initiative, which is based at UC Berkeley. It's run by Dr. Deborah Anderson. And, you know, for example, the last question, this is not, as you stated, a Unicode problem, but Deborah Anderson works on the Unicode Technical Committee alongside representatives from Microsoft and other major companies. And if she's able to help you connect with the right person working in the internationalization or localization office in those major companies, she will do so. Um, because she does work even a little bit beyond Unicode in some cases if she's able to do that. So again, the name is script encoding initiative. It's at UC Berkeley. Her email is there. She's very happy to hear from people and she actually asked me to mention uh, the script encoding initiative because she was not able to attend this meeting. Stephen Bird, Charles Darwin University. A couple of speakers have mentioned digital language extinction. And I'm not quite sure what they mean by that. Probably that language is data and that um, the agenda is to digitize languages and then they might as well go extinct. But under the umbrella of the International Year of Indigenous Languages, many people have talked about language as identity, a communication system shared by a community. And what I'm missing in a lot of these presentations is a sense of interest in what the speakers themselves want. I'd like to address that very briefly. Um, the three communities I mentioned, the Cherokee, the uh, Fofuldi community, and the Chakma community, um, told us what they wanted. They, they designed Unicode proposals that were accepted. They worked with us to define character sets for them and layouts on, on, and uh, operations of their keyboards. They worked with us on fonts and gave us lots of feedback on things that were missing, things that were incorrect. So there was a tremendous amount of interaction in these projects with the community members and the uh, people who they want to serve with the people who build the technology. So it, it seemed to work well in those cases and um, it, it requires listening on, on listening and understanding and an awful lot of uh, good heart-to-heart -heart talks but it, it can be done well. So maybe just very, very quickly, because it's a long story, actually. Um, 
back then when we had these findings of the MetaNet Y papers and this, this comparison of the different languages, uh, we needed a very, very short and crisp way and slogan of summarizing the whole thing that is compatible with journalists. At the same time, Andras Kornai uh, from Hungary, um, esteemed colleague, he was working on a paper called Digital Language Death, uh, which is very, very good. Um, I think Andras talked about this yesterday, if I'm not mistaken. Um, in this room, or in this building at least, um, and, and, the, and then we picked the phrase um, 21 European languages in danger or in severe danger of digital lingu language extinction uh, as a provocative statement and summary of these findings. Um, and the, the idea was that if there is less and less technology for languages like Icelandic or Lithuanian or Latvian or Estonian, then people will fall back more and more on other languages that, they, that, they, that are supported. And, and the less they use or the less they are able to use their mother tongues on digital devices, the less technology is being needed or demanded. And then at the end of the day, the languages are gone. That was the simple short story. Okay, uh, thank you. The idea of uh, language uh, greed uh, using the service-oriented uh, computing paradigm seems quite attractive, uh, but we have this uh, contextual challenge in the African languages in general. Most of the languages are without resources. Where there are resources, they have been, most of them are in diaspora, as I will put it. Uh, mainly generated due to African postgraduate students studying institutions outside Africa. And this thing means most of the resources are in silos. I don't know what advice you have for us uh, to deal with that situation, to take advantage of language greed using service oriented computing. Even some of the resources within Africa also, there are individual silos, regional silos. So, can you advise us uh, from the perspective of language greed using service-oriented computing? So, um, the acoustics on stage are very bad, so I, I hope I understood your question correctly. Um, the, the idea of the European language grid uh, in the first place is to collect all these different, fr different language resources and services that we have in Europe. They are scattered all over the place and we want to have one central repository where we can collect everything and make everything deployable with a, with a focus on industry so that industry can, can make use of them. Um, this is not, uh, the technical approach is not very very much focused upon Europe, we can also take the same thing, the same piece of software and roll it out somewhere else and deploy it in, in other uh, regions. Um, and the key, or one of the, there are many challenges involved. One of the challenges is to find all the different pieces that are lying around somewhere on the websites of PhD students who maybe built one data set 12 years ago that is still good, uh, that we should need, have somewhere. Um, and right now, uh, one of the th tasks we are doing is coming up with many, many lists of repositories that we want to crawl and integrate into the European language grid. Um, and, and this is our focus right now, tying together a, a landscape and a community that is very fragmented. Um, with regard to the different language silos that we have, um, then the next step is to create technologies and solutions, actually, as one speaker said, Jean, from Sistran, uh, he said, MT is just a tool, it's just a technology, and then on top of that, we, we need to come up with solutions uh, for cross-cultural, cross-lingual communication, and this is then the next step that hopefully the European language grid will enable. And I hope this, I hope this addressed your question. Hi, so I'm Lucas from Brno and I'm um, Brno University of Technology and I'm working on unsupervised learning of speech. So I had uh, two comments. The first one with Unicode. Uh, we were talking about Unicode, how it is used to represent, um, um, let's say, known Latin or common uh, writing system for um, uh, preparing data for, for machine learning algorithm. I wanted to stress that it is also to 
possible to use Unicode as a programming language with um, Python or Julia, which has a main machine learning tool. So it's very important to uh, emphasize that uh, people can also be actors in machine learning field with their languages. Um, another point I wanted to, sorry, to answer Mr. Bird. I, uh, I don't know, I'm working on um, unsupervised speech learning, but I don't know what people need. And I don't think we're going to solve any problem by proposing what we can do, but we need to solve this problem all together. So I, we need to know, and we need actually to, 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 to work together on the problem. Sorry. Okay. <laughs>
set of uh, steps that will help people evaluate where their languages are with, res with regard to digital functionality and point them to the resources and tools and uh, people who can help them do these things. So please check that out. Uh, also, I wanted to mention someone I forgot. Uh, the Key Man poster that's being presented tomorrow is a great example of building basic technology for people to type in many, many languages. It was started on a shoestring by uh, a young man who is here, uh, Mark Durden, and he did this literally when he was a teenager, and it is now a thriving operation that's built hundreds of keyboards. So there are um, many, many resources out there by people who care a lot about these things, and I hope you'll um, follow the, the sense of the previous comment that uh, there's, there are many good questions to ask tomorrow about these things. And I, I would add that not only are there many resources out there, but there are also many successful models of groups that have begun to create new resources or use those resources in order to solve the kind of problems that the question raised. Let me also make a optimistic comment or response to that question uh, to speak on behalf of the academic community. I'm not talking about my own work, but I'm talking about people like Stephen Bird who's sitting back there, or Fran who's over here, uh, or Emily. So there are a number of people who are specifically doing research in academia on endangered languages, and they very much care about exactly the question you asked, namely, what does the community that speaks this language need? And, uh, for example, the National Science Foundation has a division or whatever subgroup or whatever cluster called the Endangered Languages Program. So I think we should have a dialogue on these issues. One thing I will say, I'm sure that your community is not alone in this. There are probably many, many people in the same situation. So I think we should be optimistic and, like Khalil said, we'll have a longer discussion tomorrow. Judith Clavins. This is a funny group because we're a mixture of people who are working in technology and people who care about local languages and underserved languages and so on. And um, one of the issues that came up when I ran the Coling workshop last year on, on uh, technologies for polysynthetic languages is that we had some difficulty um, finding somebody from the community who truly would talk to us about their language, their songs, their stories. And then the technology people, some, would say, uh, what do I care about that? And then the other sort of anthropologists would say, well, that's not going to do anything for me. So I'd like to hearken back, this is a comment, not a question, to Sanjeev's slide with all of the different communities there coming together. That's all. The, the end. Amen. Inshallah. Okay, well, I think we've, we've gone a little bit beyond the time we were supposed to take. So I think it's uh, on, let's thank the speakers and the commenters. And move on to the poster session and the social hour. Uh, thank you very much for today. So we will have a social event in all Segur. So we will start as soon as you are all there. And then... Uh, <laughs> so we will have a social event in all Segur. And please don't miss it. We will still have uh, two presentations there, which is more entertainment. So please be there. So we will start as soon as you are ready there. Thank you. Okay, thank you.